Michael. Hello, hello. How goes it, sir? Uh, fantastic. Sorry, I'm just closing a few uh, thingies here. One moment. Uh, take your time. Take your time. I was explaining to them earlier, you know, the extent of your works and uh, and just sort of the nature of, of some of your very interesting curving buildings and. <laughs> Uh, we're really excited to, you know, see some of these slides you have and, and hear your story. And awesome. um, I just uh, welcome you and thank you so much for being here, Michael. Um, your company's called Zem Design, is that right? Correct. Yes. Z-E-M. It actually stands for, um, well, two things. Zana is my life and work and design partner and uh, Zana and Michael. But actually, in, she's Slovak and the name... The word Zem actually means Earth, so it's a uh, it's pretty cool. And uh, actually, there was one moment we were um we were in Barcelona a couple of uh, maybe four years ago. We really wanted to study and see and experience the work of Antonio Gaudi, and uh, you know you see everything, you absorb it, you take in what you can, you feel it. And at one point, we walked up to a hill, and. Uh, we were overlooking the city and we decided to just go inwards and see, can we connect in with the spirit of Gaudi in whatever form that might be, you know, and uh, to get a, to get a singular message or some connection of some description. And we, uh, so we closed our eyes and uh, no big deal. Like we didn't have to arm um, and chant our way into it. We just said, okay, let's, let's see what's going on. And we got a very, very simple message. And the message was, if you know, that such beauty is possible. How could you settle for anything less? And uh, what was really funny at that point, beautifully funny, is that we stood up and we stretched and there was rocks and some trees around us and we just leaned against one tree and we noticed that someone had carved many years ago two letters, Z and M, onto the tree right beside us. They forgot the E in the middle, but we forgive, we forgive them for that, you know? But uh, it was just this lovely resonance, you know, and that's the essence of our message and our service. If you know something is possible, how could you live with less? And uh, and that's the essence of this, you know, because uh, as you will hopefully just get a sense of through this, uh, beauty is the key. And uh, we'll explore what that actually might mean. And it's far from being a beauty that would be described or articulated intellectually or stylistically or aesthetically it's something far beyond that and beauty is a power of transformation it's a tool of consciousness it's the inherent essence of life itself and uh, when we touch into it utilize it consciously and respectfully and humbly then amazing things happen and that has been our direct experience and uh, we would we have heard the experience of multiple clients over the years you know so anyway, that's a uh, an intro of sorts. Happy to meet you all. How are things going on the course so far? We're having a great time. Oh, good, 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 good. Uh, yesterday, Dan joined us, and it was mind blowing as always. I think uh, always. <laughs> everyone's brains are a little full, but you know they're they knew what they were getting into. So we're just good. We're inundating yeah. them as uh, beginner designers with some of the best of the best and uh, and a lot of inspiration from uh folks like yourself so oh thank you, thank you. actually thank dan, you. dan and i are friends for over 25 years and we've co-presented together we've both supported each other's seminars over the years in many countries and continents and uh some people have said that uh we can turn dan speak into english you know so uh, <laughs> i try I, mean, I really do yeah 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 we mean yeah. that with the utmost respect you know and uh, because, of course, he's operating on such a level and uh, the information and the articulation of it is is uh, so poetically uh, complex that sometimes it's it, it can be um, quite a deep dive to get a sense of what it might mean practically. But uh, beautiful information and, and should, of course, form some key structural element of, of designers' understandings, you know, for sure.
Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been touching on, uh, you know, some of the fundamentals of bioarchitecture and uh, sacred form, and talking a little bit about high dielectric materials and charge collapse, of course. And uh, yeah. So how's your um, how's your homestead going there in uh, Portugal? Oh, it's fantastic. So uh, perhaps you give a little tiny overview. I'm Irish uh, originally. Uh, living in Portugal for the last year or so, and my partner and I are creating a beautiful space here, an existing building, but we're beautifying it and working with it and over time, and we're overlooking a gorgeous valley and the sunsets are beaming in and uh, we feel very, very blessed. And it's um, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to ground, get stuff done and continue to service and support people all over the world. So uh, we are happy people. And that's uh, that's they're the building blocks of the best future. Well, that is so beautiful. I I would really like to make that journey over there and visit you at some point. So uh, we just finished the guest room downstairs, so I'm extending an invite to you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> so absolutely. So um, we have time, don't we? We've got two hours effectively, and uh, I have uh, we prepared like a PDF that I can screen share with you guys and. It's it's pretty free flowing, so I would uh, encourage any questions or thoughts on the way to jump in, but it's not designed to last two hours. It's designed to it's not designed for anything other than opening up, and uh, so let's see how it goes, and we can have questions and answers at the end. And uh, so it's a it's an intuitive flow of information, in, uh, imagery, and content of various levels of uh, interpenetration. So just uh, enjoy it as a flow and let's see how, how we get on. And uh, I may ask, you mentioned before, Scott, that basically this is a group of young designers who are exploring the energy and essence of effectively holistic design. Would that be a good description or how are things? That's correct. Yeah, we're, we're trying to combine the best of the best from natural building, bioarchitecture, permaculture design, and okay. holistic design and okay. you know, passive house design wonderful okay so it sounds like a great overview and uh roughly just to give me a playful sense of things uh you're recording this for later consumption but how many people are live at the moment with us i believe we have nine students but, fantastic uh one two three four five six seven. Yeah. Ah, I see 13 we participants. Have, uh, yes. Eight or nine students here. Ah, uh -huh. and I see 13 participants. And I think Zana might be with us as well, but she's not in the country at the moment. So she's connecting in with us. And uh, I'd like actually just a quick overview. Zana and I, before we met, were independently in the design world. And I was focused on architecture and Zana was focused on holistic design, a lot of interiors and, and connecting with the land and uh, and this. And when we met, we exploded into co-creative collaboration together and we realized that her capacity to feel into the energy and the essence of a space and the people and the vision itself uh, allowed for us to, as a, as, as a one unit of, of design, to enter into the field of, of the unknown. Because it's only in the field of the unknown that you can access, enter and access and download and express that beauty which goes beyond an intellectual framework or structure. So her capacity to deep dive into that as an intuitive, conscious flow of information to and felt through her whole system. And then my particular capacity to take that information as expressed with and through and from her uh, and turn it into a, a form. And as that form begins to take shape, uh, the beauty of this collaboration and connection is that she can see and, and sense what's emerging and knows it to be true or not. Uh, so it acts as a sort of a massaging wave guide to the emerging uh, form, formulation, design itself. And it's like, uh, you know, if you listen to an exquisite piece of music, which cannot be bettered, it's just a masterpiece, whether it be lateralis by Tool or... or, or uh, or, or, or Bohemian Rhapsody or some classical piece, you just know that nothing could be added or subtracted except to make it worse. And that's the target 
that we would seek to open to. So when we uh, meet a client, meet a space, meet a, a connection and a vision, we open up to the unknown. And of course, the unknown floods our system. And in the background, there are various tools of expression, which would be permaculture, feng shui, geomancy, sacred architecture, sacred geometry, bioarchitecture, and all those thingies. And they act as a uh, sort of like a smorgasbord of uh, communicative metaphors and symbols and languages to communicate to the client or the group uh, what, what's been expressed here, what's been proposed. So they all they act only as models and tools for consciousness. And then beauty dives into this and, they, and comes forth. So the presentation here is just taking you guys through some of the principles of that. And uh, we can have questions and answers later. And uh, between us, there would have been four or 500 buildings over the last 35 years. So it's not like four or five buildings where there is a, it's four or 500. And we say that only to give a sense of when you start operating and being in service to this flow of beauty, everything begins to not speed up. That's not the right word or expression, but begins to open so that someone comes, a client comes, the design presents itself almost immediately without the normal process of uh, assimilating and integrating all the information, the brief, the project, the budget, the builders, and so on. All that information is, of course, necessary in the fullness of time. But if you relax the need to control and understand it all, the design comes instantly and the rest is just is just patching it up, putting it together. And so that process allows for a very uh, speedy process of design. So uh, in many cases, a client would be surprised that the first sketch is what ends up being built. And they might have been conditioned from previous experiences or just presumptions in the field that the design process in order for it to have value needs to have meeting after meeting after meeting after engagement after decision making and discussion but in our experience when you work with holistic design and this 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 approach uh the first image that comes is what's best for the project past present and future and in that meeting a few clients over the years have said but uh you know we saw the design seemed to come to you in about 20 minutes and be expressed um, our, your fees are very high for 20 minutes of work. And uh, and then we just say, well, you know, would you prefer we charge you more for not wasting your time? And, uh, you know, this is part of the craziness that when you imagine and believe that value is a product of time spent, that's a very, that's like part, um, particle physics. It, it, it misses the quantum completely. It misses the relativistic uh, understanding. So time and space uh, snigger uh, when it comes to a, a holistic design process. And that's what Zana and I have really uh, learned and appreciated over the years. So we'll give you a flavor of that in this presentation. And so I can share screen if you give me the go ahead. And you have already, great. Okay, all righty. So I would like, uh, for my cursor to still be seen. Can you guys see my cursor yes. moving? Oh, great. Okay. All right. So at the top, we call that earth and handiness, just playfully <laughs> so. Um, and uh, holistic design, because of course, holism is the big picture. It's where the small and the large uh, dance together in a fractal understanding. So it's it incorporates, like mentioned, all the various models and attributes, so on. And recently we had a client in the, in the States and uh, they were, you know, uh, contemplating along with an architecture uh, service to get a separate feng shui, to get a separate geomancer, to get a separate permaculture expert. And we kind of smiled and said, listen, that's holistic design. You know, <laughs> you don't have to get a full dream team of all these different experts. What, what you'll end up getting is just a, a collection of opinions and models and projections, as opposed to something coming through very, very clearly. Okay, so uh, wait, what we have here, if everyone can see the screen okay, it does take courage to create something different. And that is about acceptance, acceptance of what is, acceptance of limits of expression, acceptance of the beauty of this moment, and that a vision comes to a client in the form of 
whatever. It can be a sense that they wished a new home, they miss a healing center, they wish to create a community or some sort of fabrication facility for a new technology, whatever the brief might be. But that courage to create something different, and we always take the hat off to clients who are prepared to commit years of their life and, and uh, available resources and funds to, to achieve a dream, especially now when labor is not so easily available, um, materials are going crazy prices, and uh, information is not so clear as to what makes sense anymore. So with that acceptance, we seek to drop into a presence, uh, a presence with and a presence within the presence of beauty. Now, we're back to beauty again, and hopefully it will make more sense a little later because it can be expressed in multiple ways. But each way is just like a different finger pointing to the moon. Uh, it doesn't quite represent the actual landscape. So what we believe is that perception and the interaction with beauty generates the inner conditions, this entire physiological, psychological setting to, to literally transform our hearts into fractal attractors. And this is touching maybe some of the language that Dan used uh, yesterday, uh, into which the environment is invited in each and every moment. Now, what that means in simple English is that our hearts are more than just a uh, pumping mechanism. They generate electromagnetic fields. They generate a toroidal uh, connectivity, which is like a Russian dolls, one inside the next, inside the next. These fields of information and energy. And when these different toroidal fields generated by the heart start to find a center together, a shared center, and not only that, but they begin to linked together in a fractal harmonic, a cascade of fractality in golden ratio, this 1.618 and other subharmonics. What happens is that your heart literally becomes a fractal attractor. It's attracting information and energy from the environment and inviting it into dance in the center of the heart. And that influx of information and energy, quite often we experience it as a goosebumps, you know, the, the skin rising on the hand that's an energetic event, a physiological energetic event where literally our system, our aura, our whole um, energetic environment is pulling information from the environment in. So when you, when you make yourself available to connect with a vision, with a dream, with a landscape, with land, with the clients, with the whole movement towards manifestation, what happens is your heart, if open, and if your brain, if relaxed, can both your heart opens, your body system receives the truth of what is wishing to become. Your brain basically is in service to that and then needs to do its job to turn it into something translatable, presentable, communicable. So if that's not too heavy. But uh, we do want to touch the concept of neuroaesthetics, a relatively new emergent field of scientific study. It's good to throw this in in the beginning because it does show us that we have... Uh, an increasing body of evidence to show that beauty isn't just in the eye of the beholder. It's an entire physiological event which touches us very deeply. So neuroaesthetics is literally the study of how we respond to beauty, to aesthetic harmony, to proportional integrity and coherence. So when we look at something natural like a tree or a flower or a plant or a baby's face or your lover's eyes, in all of those moments, information is entering into your brain system via your eyes. So literally the retina at the back of the eyeball has cones and rods. They perceive depth, uh, contrast, color, and so on. This gets translated into chemical and electrical signals, which, they tra which, which then travel through the optic nerve highway to the occipital lobe at the back of the brain. But along the way, if those proportions that you are observing and viewing in front of you, if they are proportionally beautiful by any standard, mathematical, geometric, aesthetic, stylistic, whatever, we that the quality, the electrical coherence of that information has the effect of stimulating various nerve endings along the way. And that, redu that produces endorphins, different brain chemicals, which uh, excite the body, relax the feeling, that uh, increases the connection, of between you and the environment. So your aura basically relaxes. In practical terms, if you, we have a very good mechanism for perception that is rooted in survival ultimately. 
So when we enter into a space, we put our hand on the door, we open and push a door open. There is a very split second of unconscious scanning to make sure that there are no bears and holes in the ground or politicians or new world order agendas behind the, behind the door. And if we can get over that initial, uh, okay, it's relatively safe, then we take a step in. Then a split second later, we scan the environment. We don't do it like a computer left to right. We basically just ping the extremities of the room. Corner, 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 okay. It's, it's conforming to expectation. This takes a split second. It's not conscious. But after that moment of interaction and perceptual connection, we are literally in the space. And then the brain says, okay, what else is here? Let's have a look. Ooh, nice view. Nice window arrangement. Nice plant. Nice sculpture. I like the relationship. And we automatically start checking for symmetry, checking for harmonic uh, inclusivity. We see that the floor to ceiling height, without measuring it, is 0.618 times the width of the room left to right. We don't think, ooh, golden rectangle, but our brain basically says, sweet. And in that moment, there is a relaxation even increased, as well as a peaking of interest. So our attention as a field of perception starts to expand and enter into the room. And in that moment, we in the room start to become one. So our comfort level increases, our connectivity increases, and we start to think, wow, this isn't by accident. This is consciously designed. And then we realize that from that viewpoint, we're looking through a window. We realize that the window is in a particular beautiful geometric uh, proportionality relative to the walls and the extremities of the space. Not only that, but it points to a beautiful tree and a pile of rocks. And all of this together starts adding fractal connection. And in that moment, we start to think, I like this place. So when people talk about healing environments, there is a mistaken, and we're quite clear on this, guys, there's a mistaken belief that, belief that if you get the geometry right, if you organize the natural materials, if you let the light in in a certain way, the building will become healing. Now, it's very tempting to think in these terms, but a building, no matter how sublime and beautiful, is a compilation of material. And consciousness is always above this. Very key point to make here, guys. Consciousness is king and queen. It, it rises and is and exists above all of the material realm. So a beautiful space emanates beauty. That beauty engages with our senses. Our consciousness opens to receive it, to express itself through it, and expand into it. And in that moment, healing is possible, not by the space, but through our conscious interaction with it as a field of beauty. So we're back to that strong essence. There is an expression, two men look from prison bars. One sees mud and the other sees stars. So in this context, it's all about relative perception and openness to, to, to receive the beauty as it exists in whatever form. Because as Dan would say, coherence at one level is coherence at all levels. If the fractality of beauty exists at one nodal point, that has enough for you to enter into and expand your field. Okay, so another colorful compilation here, just showing that enlivening the mind is also freeing the body. And as many of you guys will know, when you start to free the body and let it move in, in response to the information of the environment, it starts to enliven the mind. I was helping a guy move some furniture this morning and he was saying, you know, that his biceps are painful. And it wasn't, it was actually before we started moving it. So it wasn't as a result of that. And uh, so we chat, he said, what could it be? And he was looking for a physiological answer. But actually I said, look, relax into it. Just uh, breathe in through into your muscles. Like literally just imagine and visualize yourself breathing in, but breathe in through that point. I said, just be open to what comes. So he took a moment and he started getting an idea. He said, hold on, I got a strange idea. I said, look, don't tell me, just sit with it. So he started to free his body through his breath, and that enlivens the mind. And I mentioned that in context with perception and design, because when we start to let our body respond, rather than sitting at a computer hunched over doing a, a really colorful render for your client, that isn't the best service that you could do for the project, the client, the land, or anyone. Uh, we need to just free our body, which opens the mind. The information starts coming in. Inspiration, in spiritus, in this spiral is us. 
So natural harmonics, you guys have seen multiple images like this. The human body, when you do that with your fingers, you actually perceive a golden spiral because of the fractal nature of your of the proportions of the human hand, the human body. And so God created us in his image. It doesn't mean God is a grumpy old man with a beard. It means that the proportions of our body um, emulate and, and uh, mirror the harmonic proportions of all living systems. So we are a fractal version of that. And when we work with it, when we draw with it, when we put pen to paper and leave the computer out of the equation, we start opening the door to the to beauty coming through. So literally, uh, beautiful uh, quotation from William Blake. But because I've got this thingy at the top of the screen, I can't quite see it fully. So you guys can hopefully read it without the uh, menu box on top. But so to, to see something, in a, I can't see it, but in a grain of sand, heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. A poetic understanding of the fractal nature of reality and consciousness. So we see it everywhere and you just want to enter into it. Now, this is guided and informed by Dan. Uh, we won't go into all of these, but uh, you can either screenshot this, guys, or this might be available later. But this would be the 10 precepts of sacred space design, uh, according to Dan, and we're in agreement with it, you know, how the universe is made of one substance, and the universe has only one shape, which is energy, uh, the sine wave. And the universe can be described as a geometry of different pressure, pressure waves. And the focus in this medium is that which creates. In a universe made of waves, focus creates and shape is the only thing the universe has to conserve and even the word sacred or sustainable these are words we use to describe waves that are able to hold their pattern so that's why the toroidal field the donut the smoke ring it's able to hold its field because each particle of whatever dust uh, smoke particles or whatever are able to re-enter because they go reference back to their center back out again it holds its shape, it conserves its shape. And then when there is a nest of ratios, like these Russian dolls nested one inside the other, I presume it's okay to mention the word Russian. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, in the, the, so it's the best way is this is the fractality. So the golden mean ratio, 1.618 and all its harmonic derivatives is the perfect fractal because it allows itself to enter forever and forever, forever and maintains this nest of coherent ratio uh, harmonics. And then, of course, coherence at any level, if it's fractal, represents coherence at all levels. And that's where we have uh, the connection, telepathy, nonlinear thinking and processing, time, space start working for you and not the other way around. And then when we talk about a dodecahedron, one of the shapes that you'll be familiar with, DNA is basically a four-dimensional dodecahedron. And it is the uh, a path a pattern and a pathway for light to enter into itself. So in, in essence here, this blah, 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 it, it tells us that in this universe, intention, focus, the heart coming to center, and the capacity of the brain to relax into understanding and knowing is about the creation and manifestation of information and energy in the world. So then beauty and truth, because... Uh, in this in this time where both beauty and truth are in very short supply not in not in essence they're not they're everywhere all around us all the time but in terms of what catches most people's attention these two would not be predominant but i know that you guys in this audience you are focused on beauty and truth you want to know what's going on and how can you create beautifully because all beings come into this life knowing naturally how to do this it's an inner knowing it's a code a source code that we all have. And Zana expresses this beautifully when she talks about that everybody, no matter what their upbringing and their sensibilities and their belief systems, still retain an inner coding of beauty. And uh, that needs to be excited. And by excited, I mean brought into awareness as opposed to yay, excitement, craziness. It just needs to be touched and activated. And that's why beauty you know those uh, archetypal images back in the 60s and the 70s when the uh, many people were protesting the Vietnam War and uh, that arc, uh, iconic image of uh, a young woman putting a flower in the barrel of a gun. And uh, who knows what actually happened during that particular event, but rumor has it uh, that they, uh, the soldier just started crying. 
and there was another one more recently at some big um, protest and one woman walked up to the the full line of police with all their SWAT gear and just took out something that they thought might be a weapon. It actually was. It was a mirror. And she just held the mirror up without saying a word and walked along the line of police. And one by one, they just saw what they had become. And it dissipated the, in the negative intent. So beauty touches the truth. And the truth is extre- expressed through beauty. So it is our inner desire, not just to see it and feel it, but to create it. So uh, it's, we, it's a visual, beauty is a visual vehicle and a pathway for designing the, uh, the perfect environments for remembering, for learning and emerging into our true selves again. Because there's nothing actual, nothing easier than being your true self. It's just we have been programmed and conditioned to act differently. And beauty is a very, very quick tool to get us back into that. So uh, holistic design, as we see it, is the art and science of creating and constructing spaces and places which embody and ensoul the essence and expression of beauty. I won't bother mention the rest of this because I don't want this to be too wordy. I want to get into images and examples. But there's something there that how we manifest and how we express life to its fullest potential. So... You guys will be familiar with the concept of cymatics. Cymatics is the field of, of study of vibration in visible form. It can be light. It can be refracted information on a field. It can be uh, oil or water, or it can be very fine lycopodium or, or, or dust particles on a vibrating plate. But it's a beautiful way to depict harmonic vibration. The original experiments were on a flat metal plate onto which was sprinkled a very light powder. And then a violin bow for playing the violin was just vibrated along the edge of the plate. The entire plate started to vibrate and all the particles immediately began to take on the form of the overall harmonic. The beauty is if the plate was only 12 inches wide, the pattern would be there. If the plate was 12 feet wide, the pattern would be the same, only bigger. So this was a beautiful expression of how vibration creates form. So we have utilized this over the years to create buildings that are cymatic functions of life itself. And in one case, actually, there was a client in uh, Chile in South America, and uh, uh, he he knew that a friend of his was um, arranging uh, to get a vo- vocal analysis. In other words, uh, they, he spoke into something, and his pattern, his voice was analyzed, and it produced a pattern. Now, we didn't know he was doing this at the time. So uh, when we opened up to the scene and what was the best place for him and so on, we came up with a 10-sided house that was basically a 10, 10 curves around in a circle with a courtyard in the middle. And we presented it to him and he burst into tears of laughter because unbeknownst to us, he had got his voice harmonized and, and measured. And the pattern came was exactly the pattern of the house. So his voice analysis was producing a very unique signature for him that ended up being the geometry of the building and uh you know that that's pretty cool guys you know and i say that i'm not saying we're cool i'm just saying that is a cool phenomenon that when you open up to this the same information will come through whatever vehicle and vector makes sense so cymatics is a beautiful visual tool for reminding us that vibration has form and if you've heard the expression architecture is frozen music think about that for a minute you walk into a a sacred temple or a cathedral forget the bullshit story of what those buildings were these were built by the church in xxx no 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 these these were something very different guys but that's for another discussion but these are exquisite monuments of sound and literally when sound is is given free reign to express in these spaces the reverberation and the harmonic cymatic field that gets created is sublime and represents a portal into and through which our consciousness can dive. So the following are just a bunch of images of some of the projects over the years. Um, You can see the playfulness is there, but also the sacred intent. So these are a couple of centers done 15, 20 years ago, and uh, just gives you a bang, bang, bang feeling of the geometry presenting itself in ways that make sense. Uh, even something that looks very organic, of course, everything that's organic and growing retains and expresses specific geometries inherent in its DNA. 
to allow it to emerge in such a way that it uses minimal energy and materials to achieve optimal expression and form. And all things are possible. And we've been very blessed over the last 25 years more to work with timber framers, mostly from Canada and, now, and then from some of the Baltic states in Europe, who were able to turn many of these designs into physical buildings. So this is an example, actually, of a real world example for a project in Texas. Now, there was a very small building zone available because these were beautiful trees and uh, there was a very accurate tree survey. And the last thing the client wanted to do was to knock any of the trees. So there was a very narrow zone of which building could happen. So when you take a series of circles that are radiating out, like when you drop a pebble into a, a still water, you get these uh, rotating lines. Now, not rotating, but uh, expanding concentric circles. But you'll notice here that each of these circles, you may or may not notice, but just take it from us that um, each, each, the radius of each subsequent circle is 1.6180339 times the size of the previous one. In other words, these circles are in golden ratio. Each next circle is 1.618 times the next. Just like from the tip of my finger to the first knuckle is one, from that knuckle to the second knuckle is 1.618. From that knuckle to the next one is 1.618 times the previous. From that knuckle to the wrist, 1.618 times that. So this is a fractal. Now, Dan may or may not have spoken in, in his talk about the Planck, the Planck number, named after the physicist Max Planck, P-L-A-N-C-K. And Max Planck uh, discovered that uh, there is a fundamentally small dimension in this universe, below which nothing quite needs to make sense. And this is a very, very, very small unit of length. And it's like a decimal point with 35 zeros and then a few numbers at the end of a meter. So extremely small. But Dan realized that when you take that small number and you multiply it by the golden ratio, by 1.618, you get a slightly bigger small dimension. And again and again and again. <clears throat> so the algorithm is very self-recurring. You take the answer, you re-enter it back to the beginning. Multiply the answer by 1.618, get an answer. Multiply that by 1.618, get an answer. So eventually, after maybe 160 or so times, 170 times you do this, you, you end up with a millimeter or something small. Multiply that, multiply that, multiply that. And what's really interesting, guys, is that one of these dimensions as a sequence of dimensions is the foot, 12 inches, the linear foot. So what Dan is proposing, and we resonate with this, you take a fundamental unit of dimension of this reality, you multiply it by the perfect, exp perfect expansive fractality, and you get a series of dimensions, and eventually you find the foot, 304 millimeters, 12 inches. You take that dimension, you multiply it by 1.618, you have a slightly bigger shape, length, length, length. So quite often with our designs, we take these concentric circles in this ratio, and we just see what happens. So in this case, these circles, of course, a circle has an infinite number of angles within it. You can have a triangle, you can have a square, you can have a hexagon, a pentagon, and so on. You can keep in increasing the number of lines and the angles continue to decrease and increase accordingly. So in this case, what was coming was a 10-sided shape, two pentagons. So this happens to be the shape of DNA when you look at DNA from above. Pretty cool. So on the top left here, you see a computer-generated image, which very accurately de depicts the molecular bond angles of DNA when viewed from above. We tend to see it only as a twin uh, double spiral helix from the side, but from above, it's a decagon. And when you take that shape and move it and twist it, you get an amazing geometry. So within this, there was an organic expansion. We took one of those circles that, and then the next circle, and then it became an egg, an ovoid, a perfect incubator of form. And then along these radial lines became another series of uh, integrative forms. And then they started dancing, like producing more of themselves. Again, uh, nothing random, yet there is a random feel to this. Nothing pushed, but an organic expansion within the available area. So this became a nest of eggs contained with, uh, containing with the harmonic of the space. So it, it took the form of a building. And then the building started generating a space here. You can see... Um, uh, an entrance, a front hall, two bedrooms, a shared space, ensuite storage, uh, kitchen, dining, living, reading area access, evening room with a sunken pit, 
and everything started to make some sense and a first floor area. There's the floor plan again. So no need to focus on it, but just showing you how you can emerge with a floor plan. How it gets treated on the outside, on the outside is a totally new um, iteration of that process. It can be very hobbity, very organic, looks like a mushroom, or it can be very clean lines. It can be different materials. That ends up being a choice of available materials, aesthetic traditional vernaculars, or the particular desires and wishes of the people doing it. Um, this is a project we're working on in Bosnia, and uh, it's a beautiful gathering space and a healing space in the center. So uh, you'll see the geometry here on the left-hand side. It's actually, you may or may not recognize it, but this is the womb. These are the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. This is the cervix. This is the yoni. So the entire floor plan of the building was based on the feminine reproductive organs as uh, symbolized and projected onto a field. And the number of synchronicities that emerged once we opened to this on the land were astounding. That literally where we indicated a waterfall was where they found a natural spring. You know, so all of these things started happening quite magically. So uh, all of these other things going on, you can see you can play with the geometry, but it doesn't look contrived. It doesn't look pushed. It informs the process. And you can imagine how this might look on the land. And the beauty is that it's very buildable. As Scott knows well, you see a bit of river rock stone at the base. This is a lime hemp wall or, or earth, um, compacted earth or a cob, whatever. It's buildable. This is a view from the other side with a little waterfall. So you can imagine arriving here, parking up the hill, walking down, seeing this. There is an open welcome. You see that the areas of action are where the, the ovaries are, where the birth is given, where you go in for treatment. And then the gathering space is literally the womb, the container of the, of the, of the goddess and how it might look from the side. You'll notice that we freehand draw, so we don't get stuck in computer renderings to try and wow the client, because what happens then is that most architectural firms, they're no longer employing creative, articulated architects. So they've got a benches of, of, of CAD jockeys and monkeys that are just uh, producing fancy pictures. And the client kind of feels a subconscious pressure to say, wow, because there's a BMW in the driveway and it looks very impressive on the computer rendering. And if you press play, you can fly through it. Wow. But we've noticed that most of the energy of these design firms is spent on producing the, these documents, not in the essence of the design. So I know we might sound a little bit old and stuck in our ways in this regard, but we, we know that when you retain this organic human connection, you can always draw it later on computer if you feel the need. So you can imagine here, look at the materialities, guys. This is easy peasy. These are chestnut logs. This is local pine cut by that source. This building, if you were to give it to a normal building company, would say it would be impossible to build. You give it to a bunch of uh, enthusiastic Bosnian men who are, are put up fences for horses, you know, and they just think this is it. I'm ready. Let's do this. So you can imagine the healing spaces inside. You can play with the organics because the building is inviting it. Then these living spaces, you know, you work with an egg, perfect incubator. It reminds us of our uterine experience in the embryo, that lovely home feeling. You take the geometry, you fractalize it, you start making bedrooms and toilets and dining areas. And this is a, a perfect Airbnb, you know, on your property. And how it might look. The roof can be shaped up and the volume as well as the floor plan are following the same geometry. Very buildable yet again. And inside, a lot of room to play. I know, uh, Scott, you love buildings like this. You know, you can do them happily, you know? Okay, so that's just fly through that. All possible. Okay. Now, this is a beautiful project we're working on at the moment for two brothers in the Netherlands, um, in East, nor Northwest uh, Europe. And uh, they have a vision and they have this land. And uh, basically some old buildings that they want to make into houses and just a big field, very flat. But what came to us was this, this particular geometry. How it came to us was a bit of a story. We don't quite have time for it now, but you can see already that this geometry is inviting connection and focus. And it just so happens that they have a little well here in the middle. So what to do with this? So it became a beautiful zoning algorithm for their permaculture, for what to do with the land. It's a greenfield site, guys. Anything is possible. But I want to show you what they've done with that. So we presented this to them, 
and they're very much enjoying uh, the process of how it actually works. We'll fly through these. The details are not important. And uh, but they sent us this a few days ago. So on the left was one of our color drawings of the uh, final site where we had, you know, the place for the caravans, for the the communal area, the labyrinth, the quiet zones, the car parking, the fruit forests, and all the various attributes. And recently they took our drawings and with the use of a drone and with a theodolite and a little bit of um, computery stuff, they took the lawnmower, the drive on lawnmower, and they made the shape on the land. And they took a drone shot and showed it to their local municipality and their code office who seemed to just love it. So you can see the floor plan here, floor plan, I shouldn't call it a floor plan, but the site plan that we put together clearly articulates how that geometry can manifest in reality. And then there's a beautiful naturalness that allows the, the, the geometry not to be overly present, but to be there as a structural anchor. So it means that when we neuroaesthetically walk on a curve, if you walk in a straight line, whether it's down a corridor with door, 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 in a municipal building or a, a, a hotel corridor or some sort of office block. There's no excitement there because nothing in nature wants to move in a straight line. But you introduce a curve, a curve, a curve. There is a continual upgrade of attention and relaxation and enjoyment. And you and this makes the elementals happy. You know, that literally the geomagnetic feel of this environment begins to dance with you. There's a, just a black and white drawing of the same thing. And here it is again with the geometry. And uh, they're showing this to the local planners fearlessly. And many clients wouldn't, not our clients, but you can imagine many normal clients, but they don't want people to think they're new age crazy people. But this, these, these brothers just jumped right in. And bizarrely, um, they wanted the neighbors to see what they were going to do. So they took that color photograph and they went to a cake makers who make cakes and they're able to print out a onto, onto the um, icing. And they made a cake with this geometry and this floor plan on it in color. They said they wanted to give their neighbors a taste for what they're planning. Ha ha ha. But the, <laughs> it was just so cool that uh, you can take this and it acts as an attractor. This is another project we worked on also in Texas for a, um, a group that are doing uh, religious programs for the for Christian programs. Um, for people that can't travel easily and so on. So they wanted a recording studio in effect. But you know, in many traditions, especially in this in the Christian tradition, uh, the Vesica Pisces, which is the space between two equal circles that touch each other's center, that particular shape is like a seed or a fish. It's called the Vesica Pisces. It means fish's bladder. But in many Gothic arches, many um, traditions of Christian expression, Jesus would be placed in front of that. So this was a big thing for them. But we took that symbology and we took the geometry and started seeing what's what. So making man in God's image, the divine proportions are there. You see again this golden spiral, which you see in every logo and every book of clever thinkers. Uh, but here it is again, indicating these concentric circles in golden ratio. And you see the proportions of the, from the ground to your belly button is one, from the ground to the top of your head is 1.618, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we took this. Now look what we did here, guys. We took these circles, concentric. We then took the circles and pushed them to one side, but kept the proportionality and kept the relativity and made this. You can see what's happening here, all of these interrelate. But then we take this geometry and we make it like a flame. So you see it like a, like a sacred flame getting bigger. So each one of these is not only 1.618 times the next, the next, the next, the next. But if you were to measure the volume or the area of each one of these seeds, the area is 0 0.618 times the size of the next, et cetera, et cetera. So it expands forever. We took that geometry, which was a portal, as it were, and look what happened. You start to take that geometry and let it dance within itself. You get this playful wave energy, everything fractal, everything dancing with itself, total coherence which can express as a feminine wave or a lattice of masculine interplay. So then all of these points of reference begin to mean something. So look, th this point up here, you can see with the cursor, is the center of this arc, also the, the vertical center between this vesica. And you can actually see how they all form a line, 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 forever to center and so on and so forth. So what? But look what happens. You start playing with this by hand, 
and then a floor plan emerges. So this is a floor plan for a building that will be built in, uh, in, in Texas. So you start seeing, okay, what have we got here? We've got a reception area. You know, we've got a waiting area. We've got an office. We've got a meeting room. We've got another meeting room. We've got secretary rooms, recording studio, and the main chapel recording studio here, plus storeroom at the back and an altar and so on. So the floor plan just starts emerging. And then you take all these geometries and you start defining the shape of the windows, the doors, the heights, the relative movements. There is a section through it. That slope is not random. It's based on this proportionality expressing itself step by step. And then you see how this building might look as you face it. And bricks were used everywhere in this part of the town. So we used the bricks, but we added a bit of banding. And you can see how it becomes a very welcoming energy when you walk inside. Okay. This is just a collection of images here, guys, um, of many and so, well, some of the houses in Europe that we've done, not just Europe, there's a few here in Australia, perhaps a few from the States as well. But we show you this just to give you a playful sense that all of these are buildable. They all look weird and funny shapes, but uh, they're all there. Each one of these clients was not a millionaire. In fact, all the neighbors assumed that they had won the national lottery, but they managed to build all of these for the same price as uh, normal builders, the price per square foot. So it's just when you start working with these geometries, amazing things happen because the, if you know, if you get an egg and you put it on its end, so it's, it's high, it's not flat, it's vertical, and you try and push down on the top, it's very, very strong. It's very difficult for you to break an egg vertically. You put it sideways, of course, it'll smash in a minute. That's because the shape of the egg is designed for that structural integrity. Tiny little shell but it's very difficult. You cannot break an egg, or you might if you're very strong, but take it like this and squeeze it to break it. Because if you build a room in the shape of the geometry of an egg, you can use very thin materials to achieve structural integrity. You talk to an engineer and they'll say, no, we need to brace it here with steel arches. We need a ring beam up here. We need a concrete ring beam there, blah, blah, blah. But what they're not realizing is that gravity and the weight of the materials, dead load and snow load, et cetera, et cetera, they're pushing down, but that weight gets distributed perfectly along these arcs. So you're using minimal materials for optimal structural integrity. The building is therefore cheaper. Now, if you have a right angle room, you've got 12 feet here, 12 feet here, that's 24 feet of wall. If you have a curve, you know, you've got 18 feet of wall. It might take a little longer to do it, but the cost works out the same. Less material, slightly more um, labor but the result is a very affordable architecture. And we've proven this hundreds of times, guys. Okay. Uh, okay, how do I get to the next slide? Here we go, all right. This is uh, just a little smattering of some of these uh, images that you might see, these houses. You'll see the curves are everywhere and why not? And uh, because it's all possible. Most of them done with timber frame, which is very prevalent in, in, uh, in Canada and North, in North America generally. It's a well-established way, but it usually is rectangles. But you can take the very same building technology and understanding and create curves. And as Mel, the Canadian framer who allowed us to express our work in real form, he basically says, if you're going to bend a wall, you must first bend your mind. Very true um okay here's a, that's actually you see the guy with the cowboy hat here that's mel <laughs> smiling because he just loves what he did and here's one of the young estonians just climbing up a roof to do it so you can see what's possible uh everything effectively so it's not that we're married to timber frame we we love timber frame because of its flexibility and openness and its profile but nothing here is impossible to build with hempcrete with hemp lime with with earth with um various other emergent technologies. Okay. And this is generally uh, hard to read here, but just a collection of images, most of them you've seen already, and a little bit of what it is that, uh, a little bit about us, what is holistic design? In holistic design encapsulates many creative disciplines, including bioarchitecture, sacred geometry, to name a few, and what these are. So the point we'd love to make here, guys, is very simple that every human that remains human at the moment, it's a dwindling number, that they have full access to the code of beauty that's inherent in all of us within our very essence of being, 
within the, within the fabric of our DNA that's unmodified. And we have this memory, we have this inclination, we have this understanding. And uh, when we open up to it, we can start to create from that ground swell of, un, of, of integration. And we know nothing is impossible because, and also we know that because it's possible, how could we do anything less? So we continue to uh, consult design for individuals, for groups, for communities. And what's really calling at the moment, guys, is many people are coming together for whatever reason. You know that you can come together because you're running from something or you can come together because you're drawn, drawn to something. And sometimes it's a combination of both as we've seen in the last few years. So we've noticed here as we live here in, in central Portugal, we, we bought and found our, our place here without knowing that there was anyone else from anywhere else here. We assumed we'd just be living in the middle of nowhere and there'd be a few locals that we would tip the hat to as we went past. But over the months of starting living here, we started meeting people from 10, 20 different countries that are all feeling the call to come here. And we're trying to work, we're still trying to work out what's going on. And it's not a community that's so, that's putting people together into a geographic location and, and some belief system and some agreement. No, it's a very organic process. And we're constantly meeting people that feel the call to be here. Why? Let's find out. But in terms of architecture, we are beginning to help them uh, and service their dreams as they come from relatively rich countries with a few euro in their back pocket and they want to create something here. And uh, we can help them create beauty and so on. And of course, we're continuously helping people in all uh, parts of the world at the moment. And uh, and we'll continue to serve as long as we feel the inner calling towards the manifestation of beauty and the support of the new reality and the new humanity, we will continue to do so. And I think that's the last slide. Oh, that's us. So this is the very beautiful Zana. And uh, that's me without the beard, bit of a story. So that's it, guys. That's the end. I'm going to stop sharing now. Uh, Okay. Good. Grand. Thank you, Michael. That was beautiful. Okay, guys. So I'm I'm not sharing anymore, correct? It's just my big head here. That's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're back. I'm back. <laughs> all right, guys. So any questions after all that? Well, let me just say again how amazing and outstanding that work is. And uh, I'm so inspired every time I look at at your drawings and your buildings and um this is the type of thing that uh that really attracts me and yeah i mean i have i have loads of questions um i think i'd like to start off with um you know you mentioned at some point the use of the golden mean proportions for the ceiling to the width of the room uh, as a very and, simple uh, example yes as a yeah simple and then there example, you know yeah. there was a lot of different use of golden mean in, in a lot of your designs, uh, the Vesca yeah. Pisces and 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 so on. But I mean, multiple geometries. It's not it's not just a golden obsession. There are quite literally an infinity of different harmonies and geometries. You can take the roots. You can take the uh, irrational numbers. You can take all the derivatives and subharmonics of the golden ratio, the silver ratio, for example. You know, there's many, many, many. So we're not limited by that. Uh, Scott, we don't say, okay, everything must be golden. That's our stamp. In some cases, the building is very organic, but as we're actually finally drawing it on AutoCAD, we realize that what was a, a movement towards an organic expression already had the geometry within it. And we've laughed so many times. We said, oh, we didn't, we didn't realize that the shape of this to this were in golden proportion. We were actually desperately trying to be organic, but the inner code said, for sure, go for it, but it's still harmonic. You know, and uh, so, yeah, sorry, I interrupted you there. There wasn't actually a question. That, that kind of answers my question because, you know, really where I was going with this was in the beginning, I mean, before you developed this wonderful, uh, diverse vocabulary of geometry and, and you can kind of pick and choose and add things in, you know, you just, you worked intuitively. And so at what point did you start to sort of, mm, I guess, have a catalog of certain pattern languages that you would use for the geometry you say well oh this is a good situation where we could apply golden ratio uh to you know the wall to the ceiling or 
you know, the width to the height or, you know, it, where do you apply which pattern and how do you decide at certain moments? And, and are you always using intuition or do or you sometimes have kind of, um, you know, your past uh, vocabulary of, of design patterns? Well, this is this, I would say that you can't isolate. You can't say, okay, for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to be intellectual. No, no, no. For the next 20 minutes, <laughs> I'm going to be intuitive. Um, excitement plays a role but not like wacky, crazy excitement, just a feeling of yesness, a feeling of, of, of uh, there's something going on here. And the, and the environment will reflect it. So uh, you could be just thinking of something and then suddenly um, a pop-up or, 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 or some message from a friend and it shows an image and that you're just thinking that way. So there's lots of intuition and synchronistic. You know, some people believe we're in a, we're in a simulation of consciousness not necessarily some weird alien ai uh, simulation but a, a simulation of consciousness that consciousness created this realm which would allow for the emergence of biology which brought with it perception perception collapses the wave function into manifest physical reality so if we are in a simulation of consciousness it's a beautiful way of thinking so where the source code of this simulation is beauty and so in that regard when you open up to it this body, this collection of cells and atoms and, and, and different frequencies and harmonics can tune into it. So you don't have to shave the head and eat berries and live up the mountain and say, um, we can do it in everyday environments, no bother. But when we're designing, there is a feeling. And I'm very, very, very blessed and lucky to, to co-create and design with Zana because I have a tendency to overly geometricize things or dive into it yeah because of the geometry you could do this this and this and without unbeknownst to myself i'm now in my head and the body is is saying okay he's out to lunch now there's no hope but uh this in these moments zana can feel that i'm no longer in the integrity of my truth i'm no longer working for the benefit and beauty i'm now in some idea with 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 a, an innocent uh naive um, playful energy so it's never anything other than a pure intention but the result is i'm no longer in the flow so i'm i'm blessed because zana can feel if that alignment is happening and when it's not happening and gently invite me back into it and then i have my own little movement there okay of course i, I see now i've been overly geometrizing it and unnecessarily because uh if we try to impose the geometry on an organic natural setting that's very patriarchal you know it's very um it, it is an imposition of an intellectualization a tool of consciousness not consciousness itself so a roundabout way of what i'm saying is that it's not either or there is an, an intelligence whereby we have learned practice learned and experienced uh what works what doesn't work what makes sense what seems to be good science and good philosophy and good building technology relaxed all of our ownership over that information and dismissed it as anything other than information and then open to the truth and the truth then will come through if you don't try to impose it it's very subtle but you will know and even then we have made presentations to clients with the concept designs and we really didn't know what the reaction would be and there was one client recently whereby the essence of our design the symbology behind it was quite controversial, uh, meaning it was a, a symbolism that was making uh, reference directly to a part of the physical body, which was very intimate and very, very uh, subtle. And we didn't know how the client would receive it, but we had to trust. So, of course, we did our best to articulate it in a sensitive way and move with it. But it came very strongly to both of us that this needed to be then done. And what's really beautiful, guys, is that uh, this was a, an amazing couple. And he, in the couple, was a very pragmatic man. He works in a in a, 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 a part, a, not just a part of the world, but in a, a range of work that would be deeply grounded and deeply pragmatic. And he wouldn't be a character who would be prone to express his emotions at all. But when he saw the presentation, he needed to leave. And uh, we thought, OK, maybe he got a call from work. He's pretty busy. And so we continued talking. But he came back a few minutes later, rubbing his eyes. And he said, I haven't cried since I was a child. And he's in his late 40s, early 50s, whatever. And he said, um, 
he said something touched me here and he was he was saying it like uh without trying to impress us without anything other than an inner truth a factual statement so what happened there guys something was touched in a man that hasn't cried since he was a child and his whole world he's operating in a world that wouldn't that would make you cry you know and uh but something happened there and so this i give this as an example whereby we trusted the intuition we didn't project what the reaction might be we gave everything we had into it we expressed it to the best of our capacity and ability both graphically energetically emotionally spiritually and the result was that the transmission of the essence and energy of this vision that was coming to us not from us and through us uh was touched and felt by them and they are now building it without changes now, guys, we did a sketch and they're making no changes. You know, beautiful. And uh, that's 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 how this works. Um, by way of contrast, we were approached recently by clients who have spent a considerable amount of money already on getting a sizable con construction project done, still domestic, residential in scale. But they had a couple of previous architects and they did share what had been done by these other firms. And we would never sit back and say, oh, that's crap. We, we understand that everyone does the best they can, but we can see the limits. And this is like cookie cutter, um, fancy architecture buildings. And um, so we didn't come and we just said, okay, we can, we can do something else for you. And it turns out that they were uh, spending a fortune getting designs that were basically just amendments and adjustments from previous design work that the company had done. So we never do that. And we believe it's, it's like, almost like a crime against humanity, you know, that each individual situation should be viewed as this unique expression of the moment, the space, the time, the people and the land, and that there is no repetition, there is no standard model that can just be adjusted, make it a bit bigger, add another bedroom, stick on an ensuite. That to us is not architecture. It's not a, certainly not holistic design. And it's not an architecture that we have any interest in pursuing or expressing. So in that in that capacity, probably half answered your question it's a holistic process and we're co-creating with the land with the elements of the land the elementals of the land with the people but not just that but past present and future now that's a that's a big thing to say and i we're aware of when we say it but we say it with the utmost humility because the information is available to anyone past present and future consciousness sniggers if you think there's linearity there is no linearity. There is just a total field of isness, And within that, we slow everything down so we still perceive yesterday, today, tomorrow because our brains are not capable of anything more in everyday living. But when you open up the design, we, we seek to remember the best future. And to remember the best future uh, within the frame of reference of the unknown. Because we don't know if the clients will be living there in a year, whether they sold it on, whether there's a whole other family, a whole other essence. But by opening to the unknown, all of those factors get included. And all that remains is for us to invite the clients to relax into the yoga of that space and look at the design, don't panic, relax, breathe, and just see what emerges. What people tend to do sometimes, and it's understandable, but we try, we try to advise against it. It's like a newborn baby. You don't suddenly pop, out comes the baby, and you run out to the street and you invite everyone to hold it. You know, there is a sacred... You know, between Zana and I, we had seven children, you know, so we, we know <laughs> the natural home births, the how the importance of keeping the, uh, the, the, the life as just emerging into this realm safe, nurtured, no external influence until it's ready. And it's the same with the design, because if you show these designs to someone, they'll say, oh, you're crazy. I'll never build that or it's going to cost a fortune. The builder will scratch the head and double the price. And you don't need that. You need to breathe into it and feel the the context within the within the overall frame of reference of your life and what this building could mean as your cymatic best future. Can you imagine building and living in a building, in a structure, in a home that is the geometry of your highest potential? That's kind of cool. And it may be in the future that we literally dig a hole, spit into the ground, do a dance and, and some sort of contractual agreement with the mycelial networks and your house has grown over the next 18 months. You know, maybe the mushroom realm will be very interested in working with us to build new structures, you know. 
So that's a, another playfulness on bioarchitecture. We're open to all iterations of this process. Anyway, any other questions? I'm sure there's loads. I have a question. Hi. Uh, a couple of questions. Hi. Uh, what challenge do you encounter when trying to balance the sacred geometry with the practical needs and regulation of the mother construction? Beside that. Uh -huh. Okay, good question. And uh, we have nothing but good experiences in this, in this realm, in this regard. Uh, in terms of the municipality, now I'm going to be a little bit provocative here because many of you may know there is a forced agenda to get everyone into living in 15 minute cities. That's abhorrent to us. So many municipal planning departments are uh, automatically saying no to building in the country or building in a rural environment. Having said that, it has been our experience that uh, most projects got the go ahead. And the municipality, even despite their own policies, ended up saying yes. Now, it's a complex reason why, but in essence, we believe in a yes. We believe in how to get the yes. We know it's a done deal. So we try to um, utilize that knowing and invite the planners and those making design and, and regulatory decisions to be part of the process. Ultimately, we don't care in a limited, linear way what they think. That sounds very dismissive and arrogant, but the point is, it's not about that. We say, listen, we've got a complex design and uh, we really wish to make it happen. It seems to tick all of your boxes, Mr. Municipality, um, but we just love your thoughts on it because you've been doing this for years, ego, ego. So we massage the ego a little bit and we tend to, we tend to get permission nine times out of 10. And that's very rare. When it comes to practical building, we make sure that when we have the drawings done, we don't just say curvy architecture, go for it. We show them how to, how to draw the curves. We show them, in many cases, uh, the timber framers uh, using very thin plywood cut out templates of the wall and put them on the ground. So the block work, the, the guys doing the block work who had no idea about the sacred geometry, they had to do nothing. They literally just put the blocks against this curve and suddenly you had an organic form. They didn't, they didn't need to know that this is the geometry of higher dimensional DNA. They just need to know, where do I put the next block? And once you've got the block work and you put the slab down, the timber frame guys come and then it just becomes a joy. Now, one of the main issues, and it's difficult with my fingers to describe it, but let's see how I can do this. Um, okay. I'm going to just pick up this phone and imagine this is a length of wood. It's a two by four, the sort of thing that you'd have on the ground that acts as the, the wall plate onto which you put the stick frame. If you try to curve this, the builder and the timber framer will say, you can't curve, you can't bend the wood. So you're gonna to have to do a number of things. You're gonna to have to get a very expensive thick piece of wood, cut out the arch that you want inside of it. Are you with me? And you've got a whole pile of wastage top and bottom. Therefore more costs, more waste, waiting for the materials, working with it, et cetera. What the guy has decided to do, very clever. So imagine this is a long piece of wood, but we've just contracted it for the purpose of demonstration. Watch my finger. This finger is going from the bottom left or right, left, whatever corner, and arching up, touching, not quite touching, and back down again. So it's a cut that you would do with a skill saw, a hand saw. You jump, do it again, you jump, and then drop, 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 drop. You'll cut this plank in about 30 seconds. And what, so what? You've now got a sort of a, a flat piece with a curve, and you've got like a convex, and then you've got a flat piece on top with a concave. You with me? like two pieces of a single jigsaw. You take the top piece and you put it on the bottom and suddenly you have a curve. You nail it here, nail it here, nail it here. You chop off the little triangle at the end and now you've got a six foot, 12 foot, 15 foot wall plate. And actually myself and uh, a couple of young Estonians, we did almost a half a mile of linear wall plates in one day. We just set up on about 17 different radii for a very complex structure. And it was done. And once you have the wall plates in place, the timber frame's easy. Everything is vertical from there. So in a roundabout way, I hope I've answered If it's going to be hempcrete or earth or whatever the construction methodology, sacred geometry will make it easier to build. Once you give the builder uh, the geometry he needs, you don't need to bamboozle him with all the terminology. You just say, listen, there are six setting out points on this property. 
and we will give you them exactly where they are to a relative point of datum. So the first thing they do, they get seven sticks. They put the first stick exactly where it needs to be. And from that point, you can triangulate the others. And it's fantastic. Then you've got the center of a compass. You take a compass, you stick it in the paper, you can draw a circle. You get a stick, you tie a string to it, and the end, you'd go the right length, and you arc it out on the ground with a, the edge of your hammer. And suddenly you've got a point to pour the cement or whatever it is. So if that hasn't got overly technical, we have discovered ways of doing it in terms of permission and in terms of construction that are not only easy, but they're even easier than expected. And end up, you could have a curvy building of 2,000 square feet, timber framed and weather tight in 10 days. And another builder would just be scratching his head wondering where, what just happened. And the beauty is that this information is not proprietary secret. Uh, the timber framers who did all these jobs for years are still available, Canada, Estonia, and they will travel to any part of the world and they will work with any builder for three weeks. They come, the builder has a slab done and they just frame and said, okay, guys, take it from here and they go back home. That's an amazing uh, capacity. Has that answered your question? Yes. Okay, you're welcome. Next. <laughs> Go ahead, Rain. So uh, collective wisdom here. Do I look more intelligent with the glasses or without? Hold on. Not sure. I okay, can't but it, it, really it, see them. Yeah, <laughs> it lets me see your beautiful faces. Okay, guys, what, what other question um, might you have? Two quick questions and a, and a comment. Um, I was okay. wondering if you treat the timber with anything before you start building with it. And I was wondering if you've ever built a, a dance space. And what uh, second question first, yes. Yoga spaces, dance studios, of course, because uh, there was amazing experiments done where uh, dancers were wearing body suits and on every joint they had a luminous little uh, ping pong ball and they were filmed from every angle and, uh, and did their favorite dances. And whether it was an Indian sutra dance, whether it was some mad shamanic uh, jump around the place, and the computer was analyzing the movement of these color balls. And it turns out to be pure sacred geometry in every dimension. So we know that sacred dance, like architecture, is a form of dance. And that when you design a dance studio, it's not just, okay, 18 feet wide and 30, you know, 30 long, that's it, done. We would try to make it so that it represents the harmonics of the human body in motion, for sure, if possible. First question, absolutely, if it needs treatment. Now, most timber frame would be clad on the outside, clad on the inside, drywall, render, whatever. So the actual construction timber, as, as Scott would say, as long as it's constru construction grade wood, available quite readily without all those stupid forest fires being started, um, you, you, you can just build with them. If the wood is exposed, you then have a new choice. You can use certain materials like cedar, for example, and some of the hardwoods that go silver like my beard, and uh, 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 but retain their integrity for decades. Or you can lock them in with some treatment, whether that's an eco water-based environment or something toxic, your call. We wouldn't overly specify. We leave that sort of decision to the clients. And because we're operating all over the world, we, operate, uh, we offer a design service and a, a drawing service of those designs. But every client would still need to go to a local engineer, uh, building surveyor, architect to go through the municipal code regulatory processes and in that there might be some description of treatment of the wood so we do know that consciousness is king queen so uh you can live in an environment uh and a space that mightn't be ticking all the eco boxes and you can still live very healthily and very happily so we should never be a slave to our environments um in one notable case we designed a cancer clinic in the heartland of Ireland. And uh, the, the small piece of triangular plot of land was donated by the local hospital. And it was defined by a busy road and two high tension power cables. That was the bit of land left over. The most toxic environment you can imagine for someone recovering from cancer and being treated for it. So we were a little nervous about it at the time because uh, we still, this was 20, 25 years ago, we still understood that uh, Energetically, that's not a good place if you're immune compromised. But something happened. We designed it, but we weren't involved in the actual construction or the choice of materials. 
And the engineer who had that responsibility, he built it out of metal. Now the building looked like a normal building, but it was a metal frame, completely unnecessarily so. It could have easily been built out of timber, normal construction, but he didn't know timber and he wasn't prepared to acknowledge he didn't know it. So he just went for what he knew. So here we were freaking out. Two lines of high tension power cables, busy road. The geomagnetics were in the toilet. And now they were making a timber frame like a Faraday cage of toxic information. But um, we spoke to the oncologist about this and the oncologist, the cancer consultant, he basically said, guys, what you're saying makes sense, but I can do nothing. It's not my decision making, you know? So anyway, what happened was that it was built and it was the shape of DNA. It was literally the top down view of DNA again with 10 rooms, a central courtyard. It worked very well practically for the needs and uses of the people and the occupants and the workers there. But after a few months, it turns out that the people working there were actually coming in at the weekend. They weren't meant to be working at the weekend, but they were coming in the weekend because they preferred to be in this building than their old homes. And they, whenever we would visit, they would say, listen, we have people coming long after they've gone into full remission and been healed, healed. They come back here because of the feeling. And this is the first hint we got that consciousness is king, queen, that literally in this context, all the boxes were ticked against this being a sacred space in inverted commas. But because of the wonderful people there, because of the shape and the beauty and the enjoyment and the feeling of connection and safety and sanctuary, the results were there. Consciousness laughed at the electromagnetic fields. The immune system didn't even give it a thought. So we can live in such environments and create and feel and express beauty, no bother. We should never be slaves to the elements of the environment in this sense. Thank you. I also just wanted to mention when you were talking about how your community is kind of coming together, um, there's this author, his name is Anthony Peak, and he coined the term um, serendipity, or no, synchrondipity. He uses synchronicity uh -huh. and serendipity. Okay. Synchrondipity, like it. And it reminded yeah. me of it. Yeah, thank you. That's a good word. I hadn't heard it before. It's a good one. Fabulous. Uh, he's a really interesting uh, author. Also. Yeah, that's what we're feeling. We have a pet theory that um, all over the mountains here, there are huge white quartz crystals. People just use them to build walls here. You know, it's like one crystal twice the size of your head. If you brought it to a crystal shop in the middle of Prague, you'd spend 800 euro on it, you know. But these are just everywhere. You trip over them. So literally, the environment is white quartz crystal. Maybe there's some sort of a resonant attractive force here, but we're very happy. Anyway, okay. Any other questions, guys? Michael, um, I have another question. In, in the designs of geometry, mm -hmm. do you base on long, uh, longitude and altitude of the land or the earth or... You know, you're taking account of that, or I don't know. Okay, well, um, I'm I'm going to run the risk here of alienating all of you guys, um, unintentionally, but possibly. So, an answer to your question, if I'm being really honest, is that I no longer believe that the the map of the world we live on is what mm -hmm. we live on. Now, that doesn't automatically mean that, therefore, I am X. We believe that this is a simulation of consciousness and it takes many, many forms based on our understanding of ourselves and who we are in the world and the nature of reality, the nature of interaction with that reality, blah, blah, blah. But the point is that longitude and latitude is just an idea. So we would work with the sun for sure, especially, okay. absolutely. So solar architecture is a no brainer. We yeah. would play, playfully um, align with some stars as well, not because we're expecting the Galactic Federation to come and save our ass, <laughs> but because uh, it's a nice orientation, it makes sense. We like, we like to work with the um, winter and summer solstices and the equinoxes. Why not? These are resonant uh, points of harmonics in a system of time and space. Why not? It's great fun. Um, but we wouldn't say, okay, you're at this particular latitude and longitude, therefore that means this because uh, it no longer makes sense to us. Did I alienate you guys, or are you still with me? No, oh, it's <laughs> <laughs> Such a joy hearing all this. So uh, what about the design details? You mentioned use of the blocks to you know, elevate the bottom plate off of the slab, I believe. And, and I'm curious about, do you have some go-to 
um, you know, connection details that you like to use. I'm sure your timber framers, you know, have certain techniques they like to use, but um, are there a certain set of things you find yourself repeating or does it change a little bit from project to project in terms of like structural connections and waterproofing details? You know, it, it does. We have to say that's the best answer to say that every project is different. For example, the available materials here in Portugal is not so enlightened. You know, you say hemp and they think you just sneezed at them, you know. Um, so it's it, they use concrete block, brick and, and cement for everything. And uh, the wood they use here is not, they don't have quality construction wood. So you can get chestnut trees that are quite long beams and they literally just, uh, you know, bark them, shave them, stick on a, a, a toxic um, treatment and they use those for many points of construction in the villas and the, and the houses here. So it's not a particularly uh, enlightened building technology environment. But of course, every building technology does need to acknowledge the elements. And even though we have very hot summers here, there's also considerable rain in the winter. So uh, they don't tend to allow for that. So we've noticed here that many buildings, for example, have very little insulation. Because they have a lot of eucalyptus trees that get cut down for firewood, they just burn fire in the winter to stay warm. It's not, it's not in their psyche to insulate the house. Uh, so in terms of details, if you were to suggest insulation in the walls here, they would think you're crazy. And they would think it's completely unnecessary. So it's well known that if you're not physically standing over the builder, making sure they do what you wish, you turn to put the kettle on and have a cup of tea and you go back in the default setting to what they did before. So <clears throat> it's not quite answering your question. I'm just saying that um, you work with what's available and the details need to make sense. They need the building to be waterproof, to minimize mold, to make sure there's a natural ventilation and harmony between the humidity inside, outside all of those practical details, whatever makes sense. And our own place here, we're currently um, building an ensuite from our bedroom, which is an external structure that would connect to the side of the building. And it's gonna be the shape of a teardrop, why not? And we've built a deck around it already and, and so on and so forth. But we need to know how to do it in such a way that it's gonna be a structurally strong with the available materials, because it's not quite possible to order something abroad. You know, let's try to work sustainably with what we have so that's just a question of being logical practical and intelligent at the time and i hope that answers the question whatever makes sense with available resources available labor available materials and get the building warm cool when you need it warm when you want it and not uh, about to fall apart it's just sustainability is a huge factor of holistic design not sustainability with regard to the bullshit carbon agenda. That's something totally different. Sustainability insofar as that the building to the best of its material potential will maintain an integrity between the, the coming together of all its individual parts. And that must be considered consciously and practically and logically. So uh, one guy was saying that if you put timber next to concrete, the concrete, the concrete will eventually erode the timber. It'll eat the timber. And, uh, so what do you put in between it? You need some sort of a membrane. So do you get a plastic membrane, but some people are not happy with that? Do you get a sort of a bitumen sheet and you cut it in strips and put it on the block? That's a possibility. You can get a few offcuts from the local supplier. You know, that's a practical choice here. Of course, you could spend more money and basically smooth off the block work and then paint on a bitumen layer. Is that the right word, bitumen? Asphalt, you know, whatever. But that's cost. If you get a few offcuts of something, so it all depends on your budget and the available materials and, and so on. And then you just make practical decisions. So there isn't one detail that we can tend to use over and over again. Of course, with so many of the structures being timber frame, the jointing details were pretty standard, and uh, but, but actually very variable. They were standard because they always need to be standard, but because they represent a practical package of technologies and, and, and protocols, once you understand them and able to use them, you can actually adjust them to strange situations. So how do you do the same thing I've always done in a straight line, how to make that also work in a curve, for example. And the details do need to adjust accordingly, but it's, a, it's, it's not rocket science. If you have any experience with building, you'll come to a junction, how to do this right. Yeah, you know? keep the water out, that's pretty basic. Yeah, so do you yeah. ever use like a rubble trench foundation details or maybe a frost 
Frost well, Tree uh, Foundation? In interesting that you're saying that because we have a local um, project only recently beginning and we've just started the design process and it's for a couple that moved here recently um, he's from Belarus and she's from Israel and they want to do the house with no concrete and they want to do this uh, rubble uh, compacted uh, gravel floor with an earth finish inside and the foundations no reinforcements nothing so the municipality will probably have a heart attack when they present the information so they're actually thinking of just a uh, uh you know neglecting to mention the details but uh that's exciting because we have touched upon it before over the years and because many of the designs we do we're not actually involved in the construction anymore because it doesn't make sense to travel so far for one project uh but the clients come back later and they tell us that they took the design they built it but they used x materials no concrete no steel no reinforcement we used um, fiberglass reinforcement we used bamboo um we used a uh, a volcanic ash you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and we've always been amazed and we'd love to hear these stories but we're very much interested in this project we're working on now we won't let it be a major factor in the design process because it's not so relevant right now we're opening up to the essence of the land and these people as, as individuals and as a family and that will present itself in a certain way but there will be a discussion eventually in a few weeks months whatever that will be how best to build it with the decision not to be mainstream you know and uh, so we're looking forward to that. So yes, it makes total sense. Years ago, we were exploring some architecture in Tibet and um, in one of the temples that was being re not renovated so much, just maintained, actively maintained. We got chatting to a bunch of monks who were just uh, compacting the earth with these long sticks with a weight flat disc at the end. And because they're not factoring in labor costs, this is their home. So it made total sense. Use the available material. When you walk out the door, there it is. And how to compact it in layers so that any moisture that might think to rise up from the, the ground just wouldn't have a chance, just got diverted away. And uh, you, know, you take out the time and energy associated with a contractor's fees and all these things are immediately possible. And uh, there's actually a good video online on YouTube about an Indian couple who designed a house and uh, and built a house in India in an extreme environment, both in terms of humidity, rainfall, and heat. But because labor was so cheap, it wasn't that they were paying the boys buttons. They were paying them a very good wage, plus, plus. But because labor is, by its very nature, geographically cheap there, sociologically, um, they were able to choose natural, natural building techniques and technologies that were labor-intensive, so the minerals were just around the ground. The materials and minerals were there and a lot of time spent, but they could afford to. Now that's pretty sustainable because everyone working there had a good income for they and their families. They had employment for a decent amount of time and the clients weren't in any rush. And isn't that beautiful to imagine that we could all do that rather than this obsession with deadlines imposed by the bank mortgage download payments and we have to be in by Christmas, wherever that came from, you know? and uh, contractual obligations and agreements and so on for it to be able to build organically and naturally with a time frame that makes sense that's a dream and you know possible ultimately if you make some decisions i think you touched on it a little bit it, using the materials at hand as part of your initial design process and materials based design yeah is that something that you would incorporate into every project or is it in only certain circumstances? No, we, we seek to do it in every project. Not as a tick list. This is item number seven to consider on the list. It's nothing so linear. We would, of course, make sense of that. We're well used to it in our own building projects ourselves. When we arrived here, the previous owner had just a pile of concrete bricks, bricks, blocks, a small pile. Now, we haven't used concrete blocks necessarily before. For foundations and rising walls, yes, but we stayed clear of it. But they were here. So what to do? move them to a part of the land where you don't see them and it just becomes an eyesore. So we realized very quickly that there was an opportunity in the open outdoor kitchen area to have a bench. So we just lay the blocks out in a beautiful long curve and then, okay, let's put more blocks on top and more blocks on top. But we wanted the back of it to be curvy. So rather than sort of uh, break up the blocks and just make a big mess, we just walked outside the front door and we, we got like three or four wheelbarrows of quartz crystal the size of my head and we just lay them on top of the blocks and then rendered over them with some plaster. 
and we had this lovely white organic uh, couch very uh, ergonomically physiologically comfortable to sit in even though it's a hard surface and it's right there receiving the sun with a lovely shade uh, when needed overlooking the valley and we used natural materials we bought a little bit of cement from the process just to hold it together a few bags sand was there stones were everywhere rocks were everywhere the blocks were there so the cost was minimal we had great fun doing it and the result will stay with us for years you know and so yeah we're big fans of that but we're not automatically neurotically eco nervous meaning that if there's something then find a way to get it you know so we don't believe that there is a limit of energy that's just a narrative that people have believed and, and buy into energy is everywhere available to us in every moment uh the agenda will have us believe otherwise but we're not interested in in feeding that reality because it's just not it isn't a reality it's just an illusion and uh we invite the clients without standing on a soapbox to open up to that too and multiple clients over the years who felt that they couldn't necessarily financially afford the project they opened up to the reality and things happened you know an unexpected uh cousin or or, or ancient uncle died and, and left them money you know and something happened not suggesting that to build a project someone needs to die but uh the synchronistic and, and serendipity and synchrodipity or um synchronicity opposite dipity sounds like a uh if you're too drunk it ends up being a song you could sing on the way home um by the way i'm the only irish man who doesn't drink so i think that's why they kicked me out of the country <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't fulfilling the, the social obligation, you know. Um, okay, guys, another question. This is fun. Have we got time? How's the time on this? Well, yeah, we got time. Anyone else have any questions? I, I got a question. Hi. Hello, hello. Um, I was wondering if you have ever worked with um, any Japanese timber framers. <laughs> ah! <laughs> um, yes and no. Uh, okay. I had a moment. I, I've been in Japan a few times. I was involved in martial art for many years. So I was out there training with the with with the Japs. And I say that very playfully, not with any no one here should think I'm a racist, you know, with the Japs and they enjoyed it. And uh, but I expressed an interest at one point, one evening in architecture, in the joinery of the Japanese architecture, which I've always loved, the level of detail and attention. So nothing was said, but the next morning there was a knock on the door at five in the morning. I thought, is this something to do with the training? I don't get it. This wasn't planned. And I was bundled into a car with four guys sitting around me, none of who spoke English. And we drove for three hours up the mountains. And I just thought, maybe I should have uh, written home. This could be the end of me. I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't like nervous. I'm playing with this a little bit. But it turns out that they were building me to a temple that was being rebuilt. Because the original temple that was 600 years old was in the way of a motorway. So the municipality out of pure embarrassment they were putting funding into rebuilding it from scratch up the mountain in a, in a better place so these guys decided to bring me there to explore the japanese woodworking and the jointing and the high level of precision and detail and attention so i spent half a day with them there i had about six words of uh, japanese they had about six words of english but we we worked they showed me how to use the tools but something happened guys while i was there they were showing me a complex joint and there was another one that was not finished. And I went over to look at it and I sensed the energy change. I thought, what's going on? There's been a drop in energy suddenly. And I went over to the joint and it turns out that behind the wooden joint was a steel frame. Hmm. Shocking. And I said uh, the few words I knew were Kodiwan Nandeska, like what, what's this guys, you know? And they managed to communicate that the municipality insisted that they built a steel frame first and then just jointed it like a like a like makeup huh. and like the original building lasted 600 years with no engineers involved in an earthquake zone and now the local municipality were acquiring um, a full integrated steel frame and then tarted up on the outside with these joints so the joints no longer had any meaning so the guys were doing it but they lost passion they were delighted to show me something and that was probably a brief moment of happiness and excitement that this gaijin was interested but then the, the the secret was revealed and they were so embarrassed that this is what it had become but mel the canadian framer who who was the master who spearheaded hundreds of the projects after the kobe earthquake 
in Japan back in the 80s, 90s, he went out there to help the Japanese rebuild their city, Kobe, because he had kick ass uh, Canadian mind power to get it done. They had kind of forgotten because the, the city and the towns were built. They had forgotten how to just get buildings again. They took him out there. So for five or six years, he worked in Japan. And so he brought that energy back to our buildings. So in answer to your question is, the jointing details were not done necessarily, but the energy and the essence of that way of building was very much integrated into what we did. And I've mm. always been a fan of Japanese culture and the architecture. The actual geometries that the Japanese use in their traditional structures is astounding in its level of complexity, its level of intuition, its level of geometric formulation and integrity. Astounding. A full study to be done there. And uh, so it's really worth it there. The simplicity is a screen which behind which there is a remarkable complexity. Mm -hmm. And as a people, they know how to work with it beautifully. A long roundabout storytelling there, but yes, uh, it's very much the essence of it is in there. Definitely. Um, there's a great Japanese, well, he's not Japanese, he's Canadian, but uh, he studied in Japan and uh, Robert Laporte, um, I studied under him and he's great. He, his structures are amazing to look, um, look at. I'd love, and, I'd love to see those. I'm sure we'd love to have a look. Is there a chance you could give Scott the link at some point and he could send it on or in the, in the telegram group? I'd love yes. to explore. And how you, okay. how you, uh, earlier you, you said that, um, um, to acknowledge nature with before, you know, to make it part of nature, you know, to, yeah. I think the Japanese definitely. Oh, yeah, they are they are absolute masters of integrating the inside and the outside to show yeah. it has a continuous flow of, of of material information, energy. They bring the outside inside and vice versa. And we would actively and consciously seek to integrate that that principle in all of our architecture. You will never see one of our structures, buildings, houses, homes, whatever, that literally has a door and then a three foot concrete step and then asphalt you know, or, or whatever you call it, tarmac atom, whatever, you know, that's toxic. The interface between the energy of nature and bringing it in and out is, is lost. Then you step into a, 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 what do you call it, a synthetic carpet, you know? So these, the, the Genkan, and actually there's a project we're working on here in Portugal. He's French and she's Japanese. So very recently we started working with them and we have a lovely design emerging and, and actually agreed, just finished being drawn this week. But we have the Genkan, which is the, the front hall in Japanese architecture, where you step in from the outside, take the shoes off, and then you step up into the house. So that's an integral part of this design. So it's interesting you're saying it because all those principles uh, we're integrating in this most recent design we're doing. Very, very fun stuff. Um, yeah, that, that's a deep rabbit hole that, uh, that I love to travel in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Japanese rabbits. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, earlier you showed some some egg shapes. Uh -huh. I'm very fond of egg shapes. Uh, you know, being sort of like the seed of creation. But as I've uh, done some research recently to integrate an egg form into a, a temple design that um, I'm hoping to combined with the Therify device, um, I realized there's a lot of different potential egg geometries. So totally. <laughs> I'm wondering, yeah. you know, yeah. which egg, which egg do you like and why? Oh, I, I love eggs. I had an omelet yesterday. It was del delightful. Um, so literally, there are so many shapes. You have eggs that are almost spherical, just slightly oblong. You have ones that are equ uh, equilibrium. Sorry, they're equilateral. So they're basically um, like an ellipse or a, an oval. You have those that are very elongated and pointy. Tops. Each one of them has their own charge profile. Now, if you get a fresh egg straight from the hen and uh, you, know, you just clean the end of it ever so slightly and you touch it with your tongue, the tip of your tongue, because of the liquid and the sensitivity and the nerve endings, is very, very, very sensitive to electromagnetic fields. And you'll get a slight electrical shock, several millivolts, but it's noticeable. So what the hell's going on there? The egg is, because of the shape, 
it's able to generate a vortex of a, a, a geomagnetic or an electromagnetic field, a toroidal field, because of its shape. It's inviting information and energy to come into center, which is the essence of life force. And if you take that egg and you put it in an aluminium fridge for five or six days and you, you put it on your tongue again, there's nothing. So, you know, the, the charge has dissipated, as it were, the life force. So there is no one egg geometry that's better than another. There are some egg geometries that are very easy to um, draw and build from. So you can basically get a circle and you take the diameter, horizontal diameter, and you have a point here, here on the circle, yeah? And you can then put the compass on one point, stretch the pencil to the other, and just do an arc, you know? And then you do the opposite here and do an arc. So you have a circle with two arcs, but they're going to a point. So how do you curve that? You can place the compass on the top of the original circle and just go up to meet the arc and just finish it as a curve. That's a very simple jump in geometry that can be built immediately, five minutes on the land and you've got an egg. There's another geometry that um, I'm sure I didn't invent it, but when we started looking at it, it was the golden spiral, but not. It's a, it's a, a segment of the golden spiral that has multiple harmonics emerging from it. And you get a shape that is very egg-like and has amazing qualities. That's another type. So you can also get a circle and then you can get a golden circle. That's a golden proportion. You place that golden circle on top of the larger one and then you just arc up to the two of them. So you've very much got a fractal vibe there. But the arc, the center of the arc is actually outside of the circle slightly, which isn't good sacred geometry. Of course, it's the truth and the reality of the egg, but mathematically, it's a little problematic. So that's just, that's where you get an idea, golden, golden, stick them together and hope it works. But then the two connecting arches are not quite golden. They're sort of approximations. Because the golden geometry is only a philosophical, mathematical concept. In truth, nature uses approximations. It has the golden as a thin line of perfection. And it, nature is always deviating above or below, above or below. Yeah, yeah, this is a standard one now. You've shared a screen. This is a very simple one. And uh, it's, it's one I have used, that we have used this one in some projects. Because it's easy to tell a builder how to do it. And it is, of course, drenched in golden ratio. So it is what's calling to you. Very good. Actually, yeah, see on the right-hand side there is a model we made years ago. On your folder behind this, there's a bioarchitecture DE side, that one. Just click on that. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. yours. Yeah, yeah, this is a little model we made for a meditation space years ago. And we're just seeing what, what made sense and so on. And... Uh, uh, it was fun because you could put your hand inside and your hand was tingling, you know? So it was a, a model for a space that we ended up building it, which was good fun. God, I haven't seen this for a while. I think a cat sat on it and broke it. <laughs> Sacred cat. Okay, so in answer to your question is, um, I know that you're working there with this conical geometry, uh, gold, you know, golden cone within which you can create structure. So you can take a step away from the mathematics and the geometrics and you can just explore it as a physiological event you can explore it as a field of energy like what feels right for you if you are the initiator and the origin and the creator of the design in physical build form then what feels right to you that's a perfectly legitimate approach or you can rigorously apply some geometric principles and then cross your fingers and hope for the best there are two extremes that will get you to exactly where you need to be Fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. All right, welcome. Um, Anyone else? Come on, guys, this is your chance. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. I just want to know if you had a picture of your bench. Oh, okay, let me see. Um, okay. I think I do. Give me a moment. Well, and while uh, he's calling that up, I wanted to mention also that, you know, the with the next segment we haven't got to in the course, I, I'm going to outline a lot of the options for, you know, autonomous homes. So we were, we're dealing with, uh, you know, power generation and water collection and gray water recycling. And 
all these systems that go in the home. And I think it makes it so much more valuable to have a home that can do all these things for you. Have you worked with some designs that integrate some of those systems and how did the system integration change the design? So we, we kept that, that question on deck. Okay, so this is where I admit my, my masculine limit limitations now. And because I was so obsessively looking for a photograph to answer, um, I totally missed the question. You're gonna have to go That's again. That's okay, that's okay. So go, yeah, go again. I know, I know it's hard to find a certain photo on cue. Like I, I'm always well, trying I, to do that. Oh, where is it? Okay, it's not quite showing this from an angle. I'm gonna stick it into the chat box, guys, rather than share the screen. Uh, okay, how's that? Oh, okay, you put it in the chat. So something's coming in there. So it's uh, difficult to see from this angle, but it's a wave and you can see the, the shape on the back is where all these um, crystal rocks were in. Oh yeah, that's nice. That's quite nice. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to just show this on the, on the screen there. Uh -huh. <laughs> so Zana is actually on this call as well, guys. She's not with me here, but she's part of the group. So she's been listening and she, <laughs> she just sent me a better photograph. Hi, Zana. <laughs> wondering does she have her um zana if you're on you can say hi uh okay where are we go hi everybody <laughs> that's zana thanks right. for being here zana very so, happy to be here it's always beautiful to uh, listen to michael he's articulating our experience is uh, very flowery and I like it to uh, listen to him. <laughs> He's such see, a uh, I agree. I, I only have one language, guys. Zana has six of them and she's poetic in every one. But um, I, I try to put the most I can into the one I have. <laughs> but uh, guys, not to put her on the spot, but have you any questions for Zana? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you share an example of a specific project that, of course, you use the sacred uh, geometry and resonance and was part in very important design of the construction and what was the outcome of that um, design or impact with the people they live in there and you guys, like the signers. So what, what mm. was the result? What was the result? No, no, I understand what you, what you, what you ask. Uh, uh, the one aspect of uh, this work is very enjoyable. And that is that every project, because it's such a joy to work on it and it's so resonant, uh, is ending with uh, us being so so near with the people that uh, we become mostly friends. So uh, that allow us to come back to it uh, and uh, observe the results, how the life is unfolding. And uh, when I met Michael, um, it it's it seems like uh, ages ago. Uh, the first thing what uh, what was I was asking him, how does he know that his uh, approach is working? And he said, there's no problem. I have uh, all the contacts with the people. Uh, they are my friends. Uh, let's go and let's let's uh, see. So we visited. Uh, 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 more of these uh, people and we're speaking with them and uh, the the thing is this was a very uh, profound moment in uh, how we uh, were uh, um, approaching uh, uh, the secret geometry in our next uh, project 
the thing is that we saw that uh, uh, in these structures, which were based on uh, perfection from our point of view, uh, still there was no way that something was prevented, what, what you would uh, consider being uh, not positive or not uh, uh, comfortable. Like uh, there were people going sick, there were people going uh, divorced, there were people um, uh, separating, as well as happy people, healthy people, and all the other things. So this was the point in which uh, we saw what is actually happening, that in this harmonic space, uh, you allow to, uh, that, that or you allow just your life and fold as it should have, mm. meaning there are no obstacles anymore. So if you should uh, experience uh, some sickness, then you will get sick. If you, should have a um, problematic relationship, then it will come because it's the life which wants to express itself. So it's no, uh, not anymore the the uh, premise that uh, this harmonic architecture, bioarchitecture, uh, sacred geometry, um, uh, eco um, approaches uh, that it will. Um, bring to you some kind of uh, um, better life it will open your consciousness to experience what it should experience and you can dance and you can then your full potential to to uh, figure out the situation and process it and to come through it because it uh, your your consciousness is free to dance in in the space and feeling safe and uh, 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 able to unfold. So that that was I hope that it somehow answered your question. That we are very much interested on results on uh, people how they uh, um, are doing after years and we are in contact with many of them well yes thank you thank you you're welcome so you're saying that the people who've who live in these uh, new structures, it's been mostly positive or they feel their full potential living there. So Michael, would you like to, to, to uh, say well, something to it? One of the slides we put together uh, says beauty and truth together and truth and beauty. So that when you're in a beautiful environment, it invites and encourages the truth in the whatever back, form. I think. Yeah. So you, you end up living in an environment that uh, assails you with the truth. Uh, Carl Jung, the psychologist, uh, psychoanalyst, he said that one does not become enlightened by imagining beings of light. One becomes enlightenment, enlightened by making the shadow conscious. The shadow becoming conscious is another word for truth. And when truth is a given a chance to emerge, beauty will result. And when you create a beautiful environment, you can't hide from the truth. So you create a beautiful environment and you live in it and it's going to kick your ass to use an Americanism. <laughs> because in these environments, uh, the beauty is screaming at you saying, be real, be authentic, be coherent, be true, be conscious. And you're saying, but, but, but I've had a bad childhood. Irrelevant. The beauty will say that's not who you are. But, but my parents never loved me. Irrelevant. That's not who you are. So it's an extreme example here, but we're just saying that in general, that's our experience, that the environment will give us an opportunity to breathe into our truth. And the more beautiful, the more profound that experience will be. Some clients have rolled with it. Others have been rolled over by it. And so we no longer make promises. Well, Zana never did, but I would admit that in the past, I said, if you design sacred geometry, woohoo, you're sorted. But in truth, you are sorted. You're sorted into the algorithm of truth. 
whether you can handle that soup is up to you because anything on fractal will be burnt by the friction of implosion to use some damn terminology you know that the truth will basically suck you into the singularity of beauty and uh if you resist that or if you're still holding on to beliefs whether they be intellectual psychological or physiological biology and belief are intermeshed perfectly as you guys would i'm sure know then you're gonna you're gonna it'll have a resulting impact so that's what is on offer with beauty the truth next question are you up to it mm-hmm. and there is silence <laughs> um, um, Anna, would you add to that or how's that no you added to to what i said already and that's uh that's it that's it yeah that's what uh brings the 35 and more years uh, um, to to look at it what what we have done and how does it function and mm-hmm. it does not take a bit from the enthusiasm to to do it to go the way of beauty because uh, this was the point which was connecting all the dots yeah so we we simplified our uh, concentration on beauty as a part which is practically the best language of what we can uh, produce because the beauty was straight bringing us to the point of truth everything else was uh, uh just a language uh, just uh, sharing point uh, uh, and and some of things which we were confronted because both of us uh, Michael and me we studied Feng Shui we studied um, uh, all the possible methods which uh, were like surrounding us and we were interested uh, on how does it function how we can apply it in in our work Uh, all uh, showed as a merely ABC, which you can take as a language to share the poetry, but it's it's still just ABC. And if you would put just A and B and C to each other, then you will not produce a poetry. So you must uh, uh, free yourself uh, to this vast potential of the unknown to get the poetry through the ABC to the um, humans. That's that's all what we can do. And only the, the point of beauty was the code which we are sufficiently able to use to transfer this language. Beautifully put. So we stop to to promise people that uh, uh, our architecture and design is healing. We stop to promise people that uh, when they use only ecological uh, materials that uh, they um, will lose all their problems uh, with the health uh, we stop to uh, promise uh, our clients that uh, when they design certain way their homes, they will be happy or better because that all is upside down. It's not because of the architecture. It's the human self which is interacting with the environment which is uh, doing what is uh, necessary and expressing itself but still our best way how we can um, be everyday better human is in my opinion uh, has three parts the beauty wisdom and love that's that's three parts and when we work with design of course we are choosing the 
a part of beauty as a um, very good language to express this. And, and the wisdom is uh, expressing itself through practical, functional, sustainable understanding of what the project needs and entails and can, can benefit from. That's a wisdom as well at, the, at that practical level. Of course, the wisdom that Zana would be referring to is far vaster than, than that. It's the wisdom and the capacity to connect with the unknown. But it also plays a role at a relatively flat materialistic level in the compilation of the how to build it and the procurement of the final structure. And of course, love is what we wish to express because as Zana told me when we first met, the only thing that really matters at the end of the day is how much love you brought into the world. Mm -hmm. I have more of a request than a question, I guess. Um, sure. I was very deeply moved by your story of the alcove and the couple with the young baby. Uh, yes, Would yes. you please tell that story again, just in case anybody <laughs> missed it? Um, because I was, I don't know, I really believe in like following intuition and that like really struck a chord with me. So I love that story. If you don't mind, and if we have time, would you please tell it again? <laughs> yes. I, I, as the Irish say, I could talk till the cows come home, but uh, I, I'm aware all of you guys are on a, on a live. Okay, here it goes. If you haven't heard the story, it's a true story from over 20 years ago. And there was a wonderful couple that had two kids and they, they were friends and they lived locally and they wanted a house designed. So we designed a home and... Uh, it was all based on the golden rectangle, but not just bang, bang, bang. There was a sort of an angle of interplay and there was a sunroom and so on and so forth. Very buildable, modest budget, timber frame, etc. But in the formulation of the design, it came very, very, very strong to us to have an alcove. Now, when you build an alcove that was actually sticking out of the side of the building, I make it sound as if it's sticking out like a pimple. No, it was integrated into the roof and the design, but it was definitely there. And as any builder would know, if you go out, out, back, in, back, out again, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six junctions as opposed to two. It's extra cost, extra material, extra labor, etc. So they had a tight budget. But I really, we really felt that this alcove needed to take place and need to be created in this master bedroom. And uh, he, he thought it was a waste of money. Effectively, in the beginning, she was willing to go with it and she thought it would be nice for the morning light, etc. So it got built. And after they were living in the house for a year or two, they discovered unintentionally that they had got pregnant. That wasn't our fault. And uh, they got pregnant and a beautiful baby girl was born. And But unfortunately, uh, maybe that's not the word, word to use, but as it turns out, she had a congenial heart um condition which meant she only had literally days or weeks to live it wasn't operable it wasn't something it just was a non-functioning heart and it was compromising her so because my client was a nurse they gave her permission as it were to bring this little one home to basically die in this arms of her loving family it was as you can imagine a very very difficult time for them but all their friends and family wanted to support and they were there cooking and minding the other two kids and being there and taking care of needs and so on. And uh, the alcove suddenly had a use because it was next to the bed. It provided light and a safe environment like classic feng shui. You put your back into the armchair so she could be there on this window bench with the crib which was a beautiful sacred structure that her father had built for her in her last days. And friends would come in and family would come in to see the precious little life and um, commiserate, but also you know, express love and, and joy for the few days she was here. And this environment provided, this alcohol provided a safe, sacred space for this very, very powerful life process to unfold. And it was one night that... Uh, the baby was not well. So they took her into the bed. And uh, as they were holding her, that was the night she passed. But during the night, um, my the, the mother, my, uh, my client, she um, looked and she saw standing in the alcove was her dead father, her dead brother, and her dead uncle who had died years earlier. And she saw them as clear as day in the middle of the night, standing there, smiling down at her and in the alcove. 
like in the sacred space. And uh, moments later, the little beauty passed on her journey. And so it was some while. This wasn't like a sensational story that people knew about. It was a very sacred, intimate story that she shared later. It is over 20 years ago. But she was very, very clear that this alcove was designed specifically and placed there for the benefit of this passing of a beautiful little soul. And she has no doubt about that whatsoever. So. It's not something we would claim as an attribute of the design process, but it's a beautiful example of when you open to the unknown, past, present, and future present themselves as a singular impulse to create that which will be needed, that which was needed, that which is needed. So perhaps I didn't tell it in the same way as before, but that's the essence of this story. And it's a very potent example of how when we surrender to this um, process, for lack of a better word, and open up to it with full due humility, that the result is a meaningful spatial integration of, of life and death. And Zana is there. You can see her on the video. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so that story continues to touch us over 20 years later, and it's a a prime example of what's possible when you drop the ego and open and surrender to that which must be or is asking to become. And 25 years later, we're still in touch with this family and they still tell the story as if it was yesterday. And they know, she knew without a shadow of doubt, despite her medical and scientific background, that all is okay. Wow. It still brings a, a tear to describe it years later, but it's quite, quite beautiful. Thank you for asking. It's always good to share this. Well, Somewhere in the machines, a dog barked. I'm curious about, you know, bringing that sense of beauty, the safety, feeling that we can expand and we can dance. For me, I think I'm looking to build my house, hopefully in the near future, as you know, something that can that can contribute to you know, providing food for myself and catching rainwater from the sky and you know, being able to to passively heat and cool itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm looking for ways to you know integrate these kind of technical systems mm -hmm. in an elegant way yeah yeah if you can can share any insights toward that that would be great uh this is absolutely a, a prime factor and one that actually zana feels very very strongly about that the house should be you should never be a slave to your home that it should be taking care of itself and you guys in terms of its sustainability materiality and functionality now, what we have noticed in these designs is that typically an ordinary house would be rectilinear and you would need to have a tech room stuck onto it or integrated into a basement or whatever. And it's it's a big it's a big cost. You know, you're building a room that will be the size of a bedroom to hold all the tech. But what we've noticed in some of the curved architecture that you can have a rectilinear outside, and you have a curved inside, and then you've got this leftover space which could have a water tank. So you're not sticking on a big plastic blue box. Uh, I think a lot of people are talking about blue at the moment, but that's another story. But a large blue water bottle box outside the house, which always looks like it's stuck on. You can integrate the water, uh, rainwater storage system into the, into the spaces left over in the curved architecture. That's something most people don't think about, but clients have open to that. You can have, instead of typical builders taking an easy job, they would do the house and then in order to have the waste pipes coming from the house, they would literally just drill a hole in the external membrane of the building, stick a four inch plastic pipe through and take the waste out. And the back of the house is always ugly because you see the drain pipes and the soil vent pipes and the water pipes and everything. Maybe this doesn't happen so much in the States, but it's a big thing, especially in Ireland. The front of the house just looks vaguely pretty, but on the back, they just stick all the toilet waste pipes coming out and visual. 
So we didn't want that ethos in any of our architecture. So we use the curves and the spaces left over between curves, not as wasted space, but as places to have insulated uh, drain pipes, um, other services that can be easily accessible and so on. So then you walk into the house and you don't actually know how it's functioning so well. So you don't need a drop ceiling to take the ventilation pipes everywhere and the air conditioning and the, the fresh air, heat recovery, ventilation stuff. You can integrate that into the so-called leftover spaces of organic architecture. And it's amazing because then the suppliers and installers are playfully uh, looking to see how they can get the pipes and the services and the systems integrated into the home. It's not quite what you're asking, but um, it's just an aspect of this that if you work with the organic and uh, on geometric forms, there are multiple opportunities so that all those systems become basically visually invisible and they're taking care of themselves. In some cases, the shape of the building can encourage water flow of air so that warm temperatures get um, excessively, uh, excessively warm environments get ventilated naturally, not by a mechanical vent, but by the shape of the building. And this is mastery if it's done right, especially in hot Middle Eastern countries where you look at the old architecture and they absolutely allowed for the um, harvesting and storage of water and also the uh, releasing of excess heat by nothing more than the shape of the building. So no expensive mechanical systems involved. We're not, when I say we just as a nation, as a people, as a species, we're not quite there yet because we're still needing to get countless bits of plastic that come together and joint up with systems and pumps and electrical backup systems. It's chaotic. We dug a well recently and it was shocking. We wanted a very simple system, dig a hole, get a pump. And the guy says, yeah, but you need a, a balloon tank pressure system, a demand switch, uh, you know, and suddenly not only was it costing a hell of a lot more than anticipated, but there's 15 different things, any of which can go wrong. You know, so what happened to the old system of simplicity, simplicity, simplicity? It doesn't mean lack of complexity. If you're familiar with the work of Victor Schauberger, does that name ring a bell? If not, it's worth exploring, guys. Victor Schauberger, S-H-A-U, uh, Hamburger. But basically, he's a, he was an Austrian um, forester. His father was a forester. He was a forester at the turn of the last century. And as a child and as a young man, he studied water flowing in the natural forests of Austria. At that time, Austria was nearly 100% forested. But when the Nazi war machine started building up a bit of energy, they needed to create machinery and tanks and weaponry. So they needed to smelt metal. So they needed to burn wood. And the wood they needed to burn in their immediate surroundings was all gone very quickly to keep the war machine building. So they needed the big mature trees from the forests. So they required bringing those trees down to burn them. So they couldn't just cut one down, tie it to a horse and spend a week getting the poor guy to drag it down. They needed to create these uh, flumes, these uh, water slides to take the heavy logs all the way down to the river and then be brought to the factory, blah, on the smelting factory, blah, blah, blah. But he understood how water works, how it has a carrying capacity with different phases of the moon, how heavier than water logs of wood that would normally just sink to the bottom can float under certain phases of the moon in certain times. But he energized the water by placing along these water slides little angles, blah, blah, blah. The upshot is that there's a well understandable technology which is using uh, water flow and how water wants to re-enter itself, become alive, and it can carry things way beyond its normal hydrological presumed capacity. In these environments, we should have building systems whereby uh, dirt is automatically removed by rainwater hitting and releasing some um, uh, mineral in the stone facade. Many ancient structures still look like they're new. It's because they were built with certain limestones that when wet would literally produce a mineral that at microscopic levels would take the dirt with it and wash off with the rain. Self-cleaning buildings. Oh my God, this is an old one, a no-brainer. Uh, yeah, Victor Schauberger, that's the correct spelling. Someone put it in the text. So I think we're slowly beginning to reinvent this. It may be that your the mycelial network, which provides an electrical conduit system for entire forests, can you imagine if the electrics in your house were mushroom-based? 
you know, that uh, chemicals, proteins, uh, electrical signals are transmitted from one tree to another, basically making the forest into one complex organism. And the mycelial network provides the network, uh, provides the infrastructure for that communication. Can you imagine growing your own house as an extension of your soul's journey, your DNA, your bliss process, and some mushrooms? So we're not there yet, guys, but we have a lot to learn from the past. And when we look back at the ancient structures, which aren't ancient at all, we see evidence that there was a very complex, beautiful, integrated uh, civilization that was here, that history is a lie, guys. That's our firm belief and understanding. And that what was there was a very advanced culture that understood energy, understood water, understood consciousness, and above all, used and worked with the, the biology and the essence of beauty. And this is a whole other field of study we're, we're happy to discuss with you guys at some point in the future. So this is the ancient, but not ancient, uh, technology, understanding, architecture, and society that existed and has been actively and dedicatedly suppressed from our understanding. So Zan and I have traveled the world um, teasing this information back into our conscious awareness. And it's for another another day's discussion for sure. But uh, we're very clearly of the understanding and belief that um, this technology exists and we're seeking to remember it for ourselves and for our clients. But there's a long way to go. Or maybe there isn't. Okay, that caused an unusual amount of silence. And I uh, ask a question. Shoot. Um, thanks so much for these uh, amazing sayings that, uh, about consciousness. I've written to so many of those down. Um, so I've been lucky to have been born and raised in Arizona, beautiful Arizona in 1973, and I'm going to be 50 this year. And I've seen so many changes, you know, from, uh, 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 you know, within an hour, you can be in all these different microclimates and, but yeah. you know, there's less insects, there's less uh, herds of the ancient ones, elk, deer, buffalo. Uh, 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 a lot of people are not following um uh, rules that to uh, not have fencing that uh, cuts off the access uh, to uh, herding to, to food and water and shelter. Um, and I've spent time in the Amazon and also Finland and you see, you know, they've, they've had hectare gardens, you know, for centuries, you know, that have into where their human structures are integrated. And I'm just thinking about like the Pachamama uh, Alliance, how they work with the condor and the eagle philosophy, the the north is the uh, the the uh, the condor. Uh, no, that is the eagle, which represents a material, cultural, but just spiritually deprived. And the south is the condor, which is spiritually rich and materially. Uh, yeah. Um, like, how can we get consumers to you know invest in biodiverse habitat regeneration and instead of our cities, you know, like Phoenix is it's a city that's spread out like this and all the way up into beautiful Sedona, a lot all along all the waterways, it's congested with <laughs> all these structures that just take and they don't actually regenerate or maintain all the other life forms around them, you know, all that. So, yeah. Well, actually, Arizona is one of our favorite places in the world. I was first there in the late 80s and uh, know it very well. And when I first visited Phoenix in 89, and then I saw it more recently, I was shocked at what it had become. So we know that part of the world very well. Now, these are questions that we ask ourselves and everyone is asking, anyone who's half, half a brain of consciousness left, they will uh, ask the question, how can we dot, 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 how can we change the essence in the mind of the consumer and so on and the end user, et cetera. But we, in the beginning of the presentation, we showed these cymatic patterns. And each one is beautiful if the key signature tones are, are harmonic, blah, blah, blah. If you see it as a series of still photographs, you can say beautiful, 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 beautiful. And you can say, actually, these were six photographs of the same material experiencing five different tones. And wow, isn't that interesting? Blah, blah, blah. However, if you were to observe these five uh, cinematic patterns as a video, and you slowed it down, and you watched what was going on, you see the first one creating that pattern. And then the second one just comes. But guys, what happens between the two? There is a breakdown. 
the previous pattern must dissolve. And it can take just a split second, but in that moment, it falls apart. Each individual particle says, I'm out. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer dancing to the tune of what was, but some part of me can hear the tune of what is. I will orientate myself according to that. And when a split second, a new pattern emerges. And that's what we believe is going on at the moment. If we try to spread it into some sort of sociological experiment where we're heading in a certain direction, no. Consciousness, we will have free energy devices when the consciousness is up for it. Yeah. We're not ready yet. We'll just turn it into a stupid weapon. So the free energy will make itself available at that point. So we're not claiming that the Galactic Federation will save us and here come the free energy devices and the med beds. We think this is about a cymatic functional shift. And it will happen like that when we're ready. Okay. Not, when we, not when we are deemed to be ready by some so-called advanced intelligence. We know ourselves. And guess what? The best way to that cymatic function is beauty. Mm. Are, there, are your words beautiful? Mm. Are how you express yourself? Do you say what you mean? Do you mean what you say? This could be described as a beautiful expression, a beautiful form of communication. The moment you drop into fear, the moment you drop into anything less than an integral sense of who you truly are and how you wish to engage with others and the world you're in, that answers the question, how can we? We can just do our, do our best to make a bit more beauty every day in the world and to do our best to speak and feel and express beauty, uh, sorry, truth, in how we communicate, how we relate to ourselves, our own body, now, um, I'm blessed because my life with Zana provides me with the oracle of truth because she can feel the essence of truth and informs and enlightens and invites me and challenges me to accept that in our, not just in our design processing, but in, in the life. And uh, so how that manifests, it manifests in many different ways in the body, in the feeling of yes or no, and what that might mean. So ultimately, we are a fractal of the totality. So you can take 100 individuals from diverse backgrounds, you drop them together, and you will get the same fractal proportionality of wonderful people, psychopaths, idiots, intelligentsia, and it's a fractal. Yet all of those are pre-existing and expressing within each of us. Now, we can call them many things, archetypal settings, tendencies, conditional characteristics of personality, whatever fancy words make sense. But ultimately, we are a fractal of the whole. What would you wish to do with your body, with your heart, with your mind? How's your heart today? And then we take this and we decide to create a space based on this intention. It could just be rearranging the desk in front of you right now into something that feels right to you. Okay, the cows are coming home at this point, but uh, Zana, would you add something to this? Thank you. <laughs> no, as usual, you said it's a very, very uh, yeah, uh, whole, I would say. But uh, Maybe I just uh, say something uh, uh, about the cymatic pattern that uh, actually what you described in the question is already the new cymatic pattern and it's there. And uh, as it is in this change, what Michael uh, described, some particles already hear the new cymatic. So that's why you put the question because you already hear this new cymatic pattern. And some of the particle in the whole change will uh, collect in the middle because of fear of, of change. So they don't want to jump there in the new pattern. So that's what ha happens uh, by the change of the tone some of the, the particles are already dancing on the on the surface on the edge of the uh, plate and forming already the the new pattern mm -hmm. and this is what we are doing here as we are speaking yeah thank you that brought me to tears thank you <laughs> when's when's your birthday uh october 15th no <laughs> I am the 14th of oh, October, yeah. also 50. Oh, wow. Well, happy birthday this year. <laughs> she's, a day, she's a day older than you. That's interesting. Wow, that's amazing. Both Libras. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Zana's a Libra because I'm a Gemini. She has to try and balance my schizophrenia, you know? 
When's your birthday? 16th of June. I'm May 29th for bookends. Ah, we're bookends, <laughs> exactly. Jiminy and book, all four of us. <laughs> cool. So any more vaguely architecture related questions? Because Zan and I could go into a thousand different directions, but uh, I'm sure Scott wants to keep it vaguely focused. But if this, we're open to anything right now, if you wish. There we go. I was saying at the beginning of the class, it is holistic. And that's yeah. what's so exciting for me. I've always been into, you know, this approach where it's it's holistic. So really any of your life experience and your feelings come into play. And so much of the conventional architecture, people are a little bit closed off from their feelings. And so that's that's why I resonate so much with you guys and you know the work that you've done. And it's just so beautiful. And um, you know. Um, I think everybody here feels that and, and, you know, we all want to participate and, and create beautiful architecture that's holistic as well. So, I mean, everybody here is going to go forward and, and maybe do their own projects at some point. Um, and, you know, we have a, a project coming up at the end of this workshop that's just three days hands on. And what we're trying to accomplish is to build maybe a one quarter scale model of a small home, one unit that, you know, could be, it could be modular. So it could be something you could expand and make bigger, but it, it should represent sort of our consensus in this group, including you guys, um, mm -hmm. of what we feel would be the best to try at this time, you know, something that we would really want to do. And maybe we can't quite do yet at full scale in a, in a full project, but I'm prepared to take this in any direction. And we were, we were just talking this morning about, you know, what exactly we want to do. And as they, as the class here becomes more informed about some of their possibilities, some of their options, uh, we're going to start to narrow it down and actually pick, you know, a direction. But it seems like we're leaning a little bit toward uh, vaults mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, obviously with my background a lot in vaults and domes and masonry. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of everyone's interested in autonomous homes. So the systems aspect is pretty important. Absolutely. Um, but, yeah. Wonderful. Well, that sounds good. And for those that are connected, we do, we do engage in a mentor capacity, if that doesn't sound too lofty, because we know that many young fledging architects and designers if they have a project and they do feel a little bit um, out to sea a little bit, we do offer a mentoring process that uh, ultimately, if the client feels benefit, um, then they can integrate that into some sort of a fee structure that makes sense. So uh, the young designer learns through the process of integration. So we are not designing the place, we're guiding the young designer to find their own truth. And uh, that has worked very well quite recently, actually, a project in Texas. And um, it ended up being a, a remarkable psychological process for the client and the designer. They went far deeper than the normal client uh, architect relationship as a result of this. And so we sort of uh, mentored an energetic opening. And without unbeknownst to them, they dive straight in. And uh, it was like, OK, our work is done now. Off you go. So th that's there as a, as, a, as a service we offer as well. You know, it's sort of. It doesn't even have a title yet. I think mentoring is the nearest word, but even that is a bit stuffy. You know, it's more like an invitation. Uh, just putting it out there. There may be some project that one of you guys connects in with, you know, and uh, has an opportunity to express and we're available to give whatever um, wisdom, love and beauty that we have at our disposal into its creation. So... Michael and Sana, <laughs> if I want to do a project, um, right, I'm not like design or nothing, I've developed, okay, but I decide like almost two years ago to change my route to natural, permaculture, houses and everything. Mm -hmm. So learning all this, if I want to develop uh, 13 
let's say, a uh, few houses, mm -hmm. even though you guys are far away, not that far, but anyway, <laughs> far. So can you help with that or? Well, all, uh, only recently we've got some Portuguese projects. All of our other projects are all over the world. Texas, North Carolina, Bosnia, uh, Singapore. So we we communicate very easily, as, I, as I'm sure you guys know, online. So mm -hmm. once we have information, consciousness doesn't need to take an airplane. So yes. we can we can connect with the land, we connect with the... And it's great because uh, consciousness doesn't have all the hassle waiting at the airport for hours and going through the TSA screenings. So it's just there on the land, feeling the impact of the potential. And uh, so it's no bother. We chat, we have a Zoom, we share. If it feels right, we put together a proposal of how we might work together, what it might mean and involve. And then we go ahead. And then we prepare a concept that gets opened and discussed and shared and then feedback it. And it becomes a developed design and maybe uh, a set of computer drawings, um, which then get turned into municipal code drawings and so on and so forth. So it's a very streamlined process designed to support the people, the end user. And the, la the end user is also the planet, by the way. It's not just the fee paying client. The end user is life itself. And uh, in this capacity, we are well versed. And this has nothing to do with covid -iacy. We have been operating around the world. Prior to this, we would have traveled quite a lot. But we realized that we can best serve people by taking one project at a time, putting our full energy into it. And we've both traveled to probably between us over 100 countries over the decades, you know. And uh, so it's not like we feel the need to um, go and see. We we know the environments in most countries that we would be doing the, the building work or the design work in. So working remotely is not an issue because it's remote viewing, ultimately. Um, thank you, all of you which are here, because uh, this is uh, always a big joy for me and for Michael to see uh, more and more people going the right way and uh, trying to do things which uh, needs in this reality more effort when nothing else than time and and love to uh, listen and speak like like uh, today so thank so these, you to everybody yeah. yeah this these is our passion to to support this this movement because each conversation is underpinning the new, the new humanity, in effect. It opens the door to that transition to the beautiful world. Yeah, a little seed of, of new, the, the new cymatic. <laughs> Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you all. And uh, would you guys can catch us on a simple email? It's uh, zemark, Z-E-M-A-R-C, at zem.design yeah we can be uh, zem market zem.design that's it okay good night bye 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 goodbye bye bye everybody